Euromic project was funded by European Cooperation in Science and Technology. And Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland was the grant holder of this project. So it was here in Poznań that we coordinated all activities. And also here at the Adam Mickiewicz University, the final conference of this project was held. In this video, you will see highlights from the conference as well as several interviews with scientists from our project. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I'm Grazia Mancini. I am the chair of the um, Network on Brain Farm Malformations, Neuromic, uh, of the Cost Action. Uh, and on behalf of Anne Janssen, Vice Chair, um, um, I welcome all the participants to this conference. Uh, and I also thank the uh, organizers of the uh, Adam Mikiewicz University in Poznan. Uh, in particular, uh, Mikhail Klikowski, who took the uh, effort to organize this uh, meeting, uh, notwithstanding all the difficulties of this moment, and to, to, to have it online. Um, so, having said that, uh, we will have in the coming half an hour um, uh, a duo presentation, a dual presentation, and we will summarize, in fact, uh, some aspects of the organization. Uh, of our network and uh, the goals and uh, most importantly the activities and the achievements in the past four years. This is the website uh, where you can uh, that you can visit for non-members. Uh, you can visit and you can be informed about the activities of our network. And I will start by illustrating a slide which in fact dates back to uh, 2017 and it is the slide that shows uh, the situation at the start of the uh, action. So when we um, established the network, at that moment uh, there were 18 countries uh, joining and, and members joining the, um, uh, the action uh, and it was including also what the cost calls inclusiveness target countries. There were six uh, such countries where special attention and, 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 and special goals are for. Uh, and there is also one neighbor, uh, near neighbor country participating, which is uh, Egypt. Uh, and at that time, there were uh, 43 uh, original proposers who decided to establish this network. And at the left side, you can see the countries participating at that time. We had 46 members in total, and also importantly, also very young investigators, uh, early career scientists, six at that time were joining within eight years after their uh, doctorate, after their PhD. Uh, we also had members coming from outside uh, Europe or outside coast countries, the so-called obser observers of the MC, from Australia, from uh, Canada, from uh, Egypt, from uh, United States of America. And we are very, uh, very happy about that, They're very proud of that. And new applicants were invited to uh, participate. And this is again a, a slide from 2017. We started in uh, March, 19 March 2017. There was the kickoff meeting, uh, and uh, the decisions are summarized here of that kickoff meeting. Uh, the, the chair, the vice chair, and the substitutes were um, nominated. Then the grant holder, uh, that at that time was in Cardiff University, uh, with scientific representative in Andrew Fry, our colleague, a geneticist colleague, uh, and uh, Thomas Cushion at that time. Uh, but from 2019, uh, Professor Klikowski, Mikhail Klikowski in Poznan, University of Poznan, uh, offered to be grant holder. Uh, we established five uh, work groups uh, with leaders, vice leader, co leaders, and ITC also co leaders. Uh, and we decided to assign uh, STSM, these are short term scientific missions, so grants for short uh, research exchange. Um, particularly for young investigators or for investigators who want to uh, have uh, to start, let's say, research uh, together with um, with members of the network, and also training school. Very important, the educational activity was uh, decided upon with coordinators, respectively, in Christina Oyansen and uh, Julia Kaiserili. This is the situation now. Uh, we are now, in fact, this is the last year of the action. Action, action will end in uh, September 2021. We have uh, 27 countries participate, cost countries participating, and the number of the inclusiveness target countries raised to 13. 
uh, again, international partner countries and the number of members in general participating in the work groups has certainly increased. Um, this, is, this slide is only to show the most important statement in the memorandum of understanding of our, our action. In fact, what is the, the challenge of our action is to uh, try to improve the, the genetic diagnosis and the management of brain malformations in a um, collaborative way, in an interdisciplinary way, as you just heard. Indeed, a kind to create a kind of pan-European network uh, that gives attention to understanding of the disease mechanism in brain malformations and in particular we speak about MCD which is malformations of cortical development but we are not limited to that and um, the goal is to translate in fact knowledge to improve in fact the, the, the management of these, so these disorders so the focus was really from a kind of a medical clinical perspective in the beginning. The working groups uh, that we established are five. They uh, are the, the goals, let's say, are illustrated in the title already. Um, the work group one was meant to uh, integrate and harmonize uh, the, um, the phenotyping, the, the clinical uh, definition of the disorders, uh, and to get a kind of standardization in the in the phenotyping. Um, uh, the name of the leaders uh, are indicated between um, um, brackets. The work group two was. Uh, is concentrating on the standardization of the brain imaging, but also in establishing an uh, open access review panel where uh, open discussions and uh, appointments are made to discuss openly uh, cases, uh, uh, unsolved cases often, to uh, revise, uh, if, no, if needed, uh, classification system and to um, uh, address eventually good practice uh, guidelines. The work group three is doing, in fact, more or less the same, but focused on molecular genetics uh, and to, uh, in order to identify guidelines or establish guidelines for uh, the, 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 the genetic genomics, eh, nowadays diagnostics, and eventually also finding the place for functional genomic uh, diagnostics. The work group four uh, is focusing on uh, uh, ICT solutions and activity that have to do with dissemination, with, with um, informing, let's say, the uh, wider uh, audience uh, of uh, our goals and activities to establish the website. And the work, the work group five, importantly, um, uh, looks for research directions and so to, um, in order to identify uh, common uh, research topics and uh, put together um, uh, grants international cooperative grants. This slide in fact uh, relates to the uh, after the kickoff meeting in March we had immediately in September uh, a broad workgroup meeting. All the workgroups came together again to discuss and this is a very uh, let's say uh, um, let's say typical uh, a slide picture of uh, how we met. Uh, very strongly motivated uh, participants. Uh, the host at that time was Nadia Bahibuisson from Paris. We were all in Paris all the day uh, closed in but um, very well motivated and the slide is also important because it shows, I hope you can properly, it shows um, members who have been um, very um, um, uh, um, uh, faithfully, uh, let's say, faithful in participation, in, in their participations also from uh, non-European countries. You see Professor Dobbins, you see Professor Mahazaki, you see the late Professor Klonowski, who in fact was very every time present in every uh, meeting. And the main topics were already there, were already discussed there. You can see it on the list, uh, directly reflecting the, uh, the goals of the different work groups. Uh, this is also an important moment, has been an important moment in the first uh, grant period eh, from, um, from, from 2017 to 2018 and that has been the first work group two meeting where the topic was the uh, optimization of postnatal um, uh, MRI diagnostic protocol. The host was Professor Andrea Rossi in Genova. I must say we had a, a very good time. It was a very excellent meeting. Um, and also the basis uh, were laid for uh, setting up the uh, ideas of, of, of writing down uh, general guidelines, good guide diagnostic, radiological diagnostic guidelines. 
Um, the work group four became also very active already in the first work uh, in the first uh, grant period, uh, together with the, the CERTUS, which is a small medium enterprise uh, company from from England uh, that immediately uh, produced uh, a website where all the information was uh, available and is available. And also in the same uh, grant period, uh, um, important uh, joint meeting of the work group one and work group three that have been always uh, collaborating very, uh, very closely, a uh, very, very nice type of collaboration. Um, um, in Malta, was held in Malta, and uh, uh, there they were laid the basis for uh, consensus on um, update of the HPO terms because already the nomenclature has been from the beginning on a very important issue. What do we call brain malformation? How do we call them and what do we mean when we use certain terms? This is essential in the uh, classification of rare diseases. Uh, to make a list also of what are the genes, what are the genetic causes that we are dealing with, because that is important if you want to test a genetic uh, diagnosis, if you want to, to give a genetic diagnosis. What is the best laboratory diagnostic approach? Um, and what is the place for translational research uh, from, you know, from the, the, the bench side to the, to the clinic? And you see that in this meeting also Professor Reiner is, uh, is, is, is present. And um, she was from the beginning also interested in all the different activity of the different work groups, not only of the group uh, that she was that she is leading. Uh, there were also uh, scientific activities that became more um, uh, uh, even more relevant uh, in the grant period too. And here it is a list of what we in fact all did. Uh, in 2018, we had the opportunity to, to um, uh, add, let's say, a, a satellite workshop to the European Society of Human Genetics meetings that was held in Milano. Uh, and it was, um, let's say, a, a workshop with presentation from the, uh, all members, let's say, of our network on reverse phenotyping and pattern recognition. And it was very well received. Um, I remember it was very, very crowded, it went far beyond our expectations. In the meetings um, uh, of the work group one and five in Lisbona and uh, in Barcelona, um, the topic were very similar. They were really hard working meeting because uh, we worked all very hard on the standards on again, definition of HPO terms. And for the first time, there was also the participation of uh, Professor Malinger, who indeed uh, um, uh, showed us the importance of including, let's say, a kind of prenatal task force in the um, uh, radiological classification and also in the recognition, in the uh, diagnostics of brain malformations. And also in the meantime, the uh, MRI review platform was set up by uh, Martin De Quinn and, uh, and has been very um, uh, fruitful. Um, the, uh, one of the, um, uh, um, the, the milestones, uh, in my opinion, was also the, um, the Work Group 5 conference in Rehovot that we had in uh, March 2019 that uh, represented the participation of, that included the participation of many more uh, scientists, many more uh, neuroscientists, but also scientists from very different clinical, preclinical and educational disciplines with more than 150 participants and uh, many of the participants were not members of the, our network. So uh, it means that our network started to um, um, uh, gather also and to raise the interest of uh, people outside uh, the, the, the small group of the network. And uh, I don't need to tell you, and I'm um, long convinced that uh, science is never boring, but this is also a confirmation that it is really true, and it is on the occasion of a wonderful uh, Purim festivity. We were there, there accidentally in Rehovot, so uh, Orly Reiner organized for us also such a beautiful uh, afternoon and evening. Never forget it. In the um, grant period three, uh, there were again a lot of scientific activities, but I think the, the, the highlight is on the uh, meeting in Marseille, uh, hosted by Carlos Cardoso, uh, that uh, is in fact one of the last meetings that we had uh, live, uh, unfortunately, and it, it was um, uh, divided in two main topics. One was that of, um, uh, again, going on the uh, studies and the and, and, and research on the etiology and pathophysiology of the brain 
brain malformations or uh, transcriptomics in brain research and the use of eventual of models or whatever models in the um, study of brain uh, disorder developmental disorders but the second day was a long uh, discussion about a round table about the future of our uh, network and how do we want to go on what could be what will be the next goals because certainly we are, have not finished and we have not uh, reached all our you know goals again in this meeting there was an increased participation of neuroscientists basic scientists and many new memberships uh, have been uh, um, granted i mean have been included many new members have been included in our uh, in our network after that uh, in the same year, there was a second satellite meeting uh, in, in Athens in September, satellite to the European Pediatric Neurology Society uh, annual meeting, uh, and it was organized by uh, Anne Janssen, and um, this was also very well received, all the, the speakers were uh, members of our network, you see some of them on the, on the picture, um, and um, it was, uh, not only there were more than, I think, than, than 100 people present, but uh, the European Pediatric Neurology Society was so um, uh, positive about the, uh, the, 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 the workshop that they proposed uh, us to publish a kind of special issue on the topics of the meeting uh, um, in the European society. Um, and uh, I think at this point I give the word to, to Anne Janssen for uh, the rest of the achievements and the results of our action. Anne, can I give you the word? Yes, um, I'm going to see if I can also, will you, will you keep the slides, Gracia? Yes, I will. You can ask me to um, okay. go on with the slides if you want. So welcome also from uh, from my side. It's really wonderful to see so many familiar names, at least not yet the faces in the participants list. Um, I will brief you briefly uh, take you through um, uh, the focus on the educational activities and the output uh, from from our action. Uh, so the next slide, Gracia. So. Yeah, during the, 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 the duration of the cost action, um, several activities were organized mainly with a focus to facilitate collaborations uh, for early career investigators. And these included on the one hand, uh, the training schools, um, and we'll briefly review um, the activities there. Um, the, the queen of the training schools is uh, Julia Kaisrilli. Uh, she really has uh, been very, uh, very active and, and, and really very supportive uh, to, to get all these uh, uh, training schools uh, organized uh, to, in close collaboration with the local organizers, of course. And then also the short time scientific mission grants. Um, and in total, we have had 19 uh, short time scientific missions. Uh, so six in the first grant period, 11 in the second grant period, and then two in the third grant period, with one of which is still pending uh, because of the COVID pandemic and it's much more difficult now for somebody to go to another lab. Um, and so these short time scientific missions, uh, the calls and the review of the applications uh, have been uh, organized by our Danish colleague Christina Hui Hansen, who also did a wonderful uh, job to be uh, available for, um, for the young investigators. Um, so many people from different labs have traveled across Europe to spend uh, some time uh, with another research group in order to facilitate uh, collaboration. I think these uh, short time scientific missions for many of the young investigators have really been um, you know, very, very important uh, as a basis for their future work. And this is the first training school that was organized. Uh, it was organized in Zagreb in 2018 with a focus on the genomics and imaging of uh, malformations of brain development organized by uh, the Zagreb team uh, consisting of uh, Professor Jovanov Milosevic, Petanjek and Kostovic, um, where, you, as you can see in the picture, many, many people came together for this uh, first uh, training school mixing more experienced and early career um, people in the field. And then we go to the second training school, which was organized in Serbia, Novi Sad, um, that was focused on pathology, 
organized by uh, Ivan Chapo and his colleague. Um, and, and that also uh, was a um, very well organized training school. I also learned from one of my colleagues who attended that um, it was really hands-on practical um, with a lot of material uh, that was prepared, also made available for the participants to, to be able to come back to uh, after, after the training school. Um, and then the third training school was organized in um, Bucharest, in Romania. Uh, that was uh, in 2000, in the spring of uh, 2020. I think it's uh, probably the the last uh, the last place uh, I, I traveled to uh, over the last year, uh, just before um, at least here in Belgium lockdown started. Uh, that was organized by uh, professors Arhir and Budistanio, um, focusing on clinical management of brain malformations. And again, was a, a very good mix um, with uh, topics from, from different angles, which had been uh, discussed and very good uh, attendance as well. And then we go to the next slide. So there will be um, a four training school, but uh, unfortunately, this will be a virtual training school, which is um, not so easy to organize because the, the, the philosophy of the training school really is the get together and the, the uh, very close uh, interaction and collaboration and, and practical training as well. So, but this one will be organized early September, uh, was decided just earlier on during the management committee meeting. Um, so, um, uh, Julia Kaiserili will, will um, be the host in collaboration with uh, Carlos Cardoso and Gustavo Malinger, and you will very soon receive more information uh, about this through the usual Neuromic channels. And the topic will focus on the natural history of uh, MCD. Then I'll zoom to um, the scientific output. Um, so many, many collaborative publications have seen the light since the start of the Neuromic Action. Um, most of them are on the website. Not all of them are on the website. Uh, people are still um, welcome to share publications uh, where where different groups from the cost action have been involved and we will be very happy to have them also on the website so you can let uh, contact either Andrew Fry or myself uh, and we will uh, be happy to uh, to put the publication online. There have been several collaborative projects and um, I'll highlight some of these and then two special issues in international journals, one of which has been published and the other one, uh, as Gracia already mentioned, is the uh, spin-off of the uh, satellite meeting at the uh, European Pediatric Neurology Society meeting in Athens um, and is currently under in preparation. So next slide. So this is the uh, first special issue published in the European Journal of Medical Genetics um, in 2018, focusing on MCD phenotypic uh, delineation and a refinement using uh, NGS. And it was guest edited by Nadia Bahibuisson, uh, Andrew, Gracia and myself. And it, uh, it consists of 10 articles on a wide range of clinical experimental research, some case reports and reviews. So it's also uh, available and all these uh, articles are also listed on the Neuromic uh, website. Next slide. Uh, then uh, also as an, um, uh, a result of the discussions on uh, human phenotype ontology uh, within mini work group uh, three, um, there has been a participation in a publication uh, in 2018 online, in 2019 uh, uh, in the Journal of Nucleic Acid Research, um, where uh, Renske Uguma and David Gomez Andres uh, took, uh, took the lead. So what's important is that it, the HPO are really the standard for deep phenotyping of rare diseases and is currently also applied in the uh, diagnostic NGS pipelines for genetic disorders. And therefore, it's really very important that um, we, we speak a common language uh, between geneticists, uh, radiologists, clinicians, uh, to, to make sure that we that we come to the same results uh, and so finding a common language and agreeing on 
uh, definitions and on terminology, therefore, is, is really key. So um, uh, a part of the route has been traveled there, um, but there definitely is room for further improvement. And I think it's something that uh, um, also due to the pandemic has been more difficult to, to take forward, but it's definitely something that uh, the field needs to continue working on over the coming uh, years. Next slide. Um, Grazia also show, already showed you some beautiful pictures of the uh, meeting that we had in Rehovot. I think personally also for me it was really a, a milestone meeting and a highlight of our, uh, of our cost action. Uh, I think there we really very strongly felt the, the interaction between uh, clinical researchers, uh, basic scientists, um, and I think this this uh, cross fertilization has been uh, has been key also for for the future. Um, I think we really grew up uh, uh, as a as a community um, after uh, or thanks to this uh, get together in uh, Rehovot. Um, so it was really high level scientific uh, meeting with lots of uh, speakers from different backgrounds, um, very integrative, very pluri multidisciplinary, um, and so a very mixed audience, but therefore really very, um, I think, yeah, very strong uh, interaction for, for many people. Um, and I think as a result, definitely there, there's an increased number of uh, basic scientists that apply to become a, a member of the action. And I think also, um, this interaction really um, was pivotal to, to take the field forward and, and I think also it will be very important uh, for uh, our network uh, in the future. And so the proceedings of this meeting have been published um, in uh, Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience uh, and you can also uh, uh, consult them there. And then the next slide, please. So, and then we come to uh, also two milestone papers, I think as, from, from my perspective, uh, the first one uh, resulting from um, all the work that has been done, especially by Workgroup 2 uh, on the imaging, so the practical guidelines on definitions and classifications of uh, MCD, um, a paper in, uh, published in BRAIN. Um, so I think this is really a first uh, and very important uh, output of, or a very important output of our uh, cost action. The the fact that uh, yeah we were able to to get this outline uh, together, and then the second one that uh, we wanted to highlight here uh, is the the result of interactions uh, within and between workgroup one and three an international consensus recommendations on the diagnostic workup for malformations of cortical development um, with respect to what is the clinical approach. I think I, I very much like and would like to recommend the figure uh, or the, the main figure in this, uh, in this paper, um, guiding clinicians through the different steps uh, and the approach for a diagnostic, diagnostic workup uh, of, uh, of MCD. So published um, in Nature Reviews Neurology, uh, and also freely and open access available there. Um, so I think these two all, all papers are, are definitely also milestones for our consortium. And then we go to the next slide. And then the last meeting um, or the meeting that we had um, online uh, in July 2020 um, really focused as a follow-up on the Marseille conference uh, more in detail on the, the potential future of our action and of the network that has been developed between the different uh, stakeholders in the field. Um, and so many ideas have been put forward. Um, it has become clear that uh, after like um, a first step up from the clinical background, uh, we clearly feel that uh, the link with the neuroscientists is really uh, essential. Um, so there will be a, a bigger focus on neuroscience in the future with close uh, collaboration uh, with the different clinicians. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there still is work to do uh, with respect to the HP, uh, HPO terminology, also um, uh, from early on, prenatal period, for example. Um, Therapies um, are, have not really been into the picture and we need still to think how we can improve uh, the management also of uh, individuals with MCD. 
um, the potential of use or applications of different models in different settings and at different levels of our work is uh, something that came up as uh, an important opportunity. Um, also, the potential contribution of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning for diagnostic and imaging techniques has been discussed and um, a bit separate, but then still uh, very closely aligned with our vision for the future is uh, the ambition to work towards the setup of a European society on brain development. Um, and so maybe with the last slide, I think I just want to um, bridge from here to the end of, uh, of the symposium where we will focus a little bit in more detail on the ideas of uh, Roads to the Future uh, in close collaboration with Carlos Cardoso, who um, has volunteered to, uh, to take this on in more detail. And I think with that, I um, definitely want to thank all of you for um, the, the road we have traveled together so far, and I really look forward to um, what the future brings. And I wish you a very interesting conference. Thank you. I'll start right away. So first, I would like to thank very much the organizer. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's my favorite crowd of people to talk and to discuss about one of my favorite topic. So with you, I don't have to justify why I study rare diseases. And in particular, uh, um, we are interested in the lab in uh, neuronal heterotopium. And we try to understand more about mechanisms underlying neuronal heterotopia with uh, two model systems, so mouse models and human cerebral organoids. And so I will briefly introduce the lab because there is not so much, uh, many of you know me already, uh, but so we are interested in the human brain. Uh, and in particular, we are interested in developmental aspect of human brain. Uh, because uh, we believe that, you know, by uh, uh, the correct development and uh, we will only manage to have the correct function of the human brain, uh, as we are cell biologists and we see this uh, uh, brain as a beautiful composition of cells that so they have to come in right number, right time, uh, right type and going in the right place. And so its uh, development is not just associated uh, and, and this function of development are not just associated to neurolo neurological disorder, but it has been also clearly associated to um, giving origin of psychiatric disorders and many uh, actually molecular player that they take place during uh, development associated with neurological disorders are also important players for neurodegenerative disorders. So it's really a, a combination development which is actually important to study for a variety of brain disorders. And as I said, we are interested in cells and what, what is happening during development that cells are generated, uh, so neurons and glia, um, you know, excitatory inhibitory neurons, cells need to migrate readily or tangentially, then need to uh, become mature, make dendrites, make synapses to become functional and be integrated into circuits. And so what we are very much focusing in the lab is trying to understand what are the vulnerable hubs in these steps of neurogenesis leading to neuronal migration and maturation, uh, which are important for the development of these uh, um, malformations and neurological disorders, but also psychiatric disorders. And so uh, we have a recent review uh, with the lab of uh, Fiona Francis actually uh, some some of these uh, key aspects and and we know very well that uh, the majority of the cortical malformation or all cortical malformation have a favorite actually process during development uh, with uh, which they are associated, but actually uh, many of the processes are disrupted. So it's not just that microcephaly is associated to proliferation and, neuro and heterotopia with migration, but uh, there are many of the processes that they are um, taking place during development that can be associated to one disorder. So it's not that we can put in a drawer uh, one uh, specific single uh, disease. So 
Um, the human brain, it's partially accept, accessible, actually, so there are postmortem studies, a lot and many more coming. Uh, but of course, we cannot monitor the developmental steps in a living brain as we can do in mother's system. And I don't want to describe all the models, so I just want to say that in our lab, we combine the mouse in vivo model with a variety of in vitro human model system, which are both 2D, very simple, and more complex, like 3D, like cerebral organ and assembloid. And um, in particular, by combining these two model systems, we are able to uh, untangle the specific, uh, human-specific features, because we know that in the mouse, we have a lot of features that are very similar to, uh, in developing human brain, but we also know more and more features now, uh, thanks to a lot of work from many labs that in which we know actually that, uh, for example, progenitors, there is a variety of progenitors, in particular, a basal progenitors, including intermediate progenitors and base radiopli are actually enriched or different in human, as well as migrating neurons, uh, that has different uh, adhesion molecules to then climb along the radial processes. And even interneurons and excitatory neurons has been recently shown to have uh, some human-specific features. So what are we also very interested in the lab, uh, not only uh, glial cells, which are the last kind of uh, contributing population, are uh, secreted factors. So it has also been highlighted recently, uh, especially by the lab of Ivan Putner and the lab of Oli Reina, uh, that secreted factor uh, taking part of the cellular matrix are also, uh, they have also human specific feature. And we are also interested in what else is secreted there, like for example, vesicles. So um, the, the main uh, topic that I want to tell you today is uh, one of my um, favorite neuronal migration disorder, which is paraventricular heterotopia. I don't need to explain here what it is, but simply neurons accumulate at the ventricles and um, there is uh, this accumulation of um, gray matter at the ventricles. So I decided to tell you a little bit, trying to put together what we have done in the past five years and the models that we have been studying to try to extrapolate some information from that. And so uh, these are the model of pH that we have been studying. And uh, what I find, uh, we always found uh, interesting in the lab was the fact that different genes that they have actually completely different molecular functions, cellular localization, and also cell type specific um, uh, expression, uh, they lead to the same uh, phenotype or a very similar phenotype, which is periventricular heterotopia. For example, Daxo and FET4 uh, are known to take part on the planar cell polarity pathway and hippopathway and to be localized in the membrane, while Elgalis GVP, it's an extracellular matrix uh, secreted protein. Uh, EC2 is an enzyme that is present in the cytoplasm. MOB2 is also an enzyme, but is um, a lot present in nucleoli and uh, other compartment. And plaque AG6 and row A are, you know, enzyme also in the cytoplasm. What, what do they share? Why uh, mutation in these such a different genes uh, leads to this very similar phenotype? This we don't know. And by also combining the expression of this gene and looking at, for example, expression in the mouse or in human embryos and organoids, we can also see that some genes, for example, are very little expressed in mouse, but they are expressed in human, while some they are very expre little expressed in human and they are a lot expressed in mouse, and they are also in different cell types, and some of them, for example, are more ubiquitous in mouse, while in human seems to be only enriched in subpopulation. So, uh, we are trying to understand by combining all this information what is actually uh, putting that uh, together. And this is also simplified by uh, this uh, idea of, uh, of having uh, several genes actually converging. Uh, so we know uh, the mutation, we know the clinical expression. What we don't know is everything that is in between this. Uh, and so we're trying to understand more about this mechanism uh, to, to then understand where this, uh, this uh, type of uh, genes uh, kind of uh, converge uh, during development. So I will talk about two topics. I try to uh, group this uh, mutation that we have been studying in two groups. Um, one is um, related to cell autonomous mechanism, and, and this is mostly about how uh, these genes can modulate and modify the morphology of the cells and the migration of the neurons. And the other one is about non-cell autonomous or cell non-autonomous mechanism. 
so the first one is uh, it's actually published quite some time ago that we found fat for endaxos that's always um, in collaboration with Stephen Robertson in New Zealand uh, he found this uh, this patient uh, quite some uh, with uh, mutation in endaxos and fat for which are uh, transmembrane protein as I already mentioned so First, we did mouse models, and what did we um, know from uh, our mouse models was just that not only we had defect in migration, some, um, you know, defect in migration rather than really at orthopia, but also what we could see is that they were uh, de clear different in proliferation, organization of stem cells, and uh, hippo pathway. So, but since this was not fully recapitulating what is happening in, in human patients, which they don't have a huge brain uh, uh, and they have only neuronal heterotopia, not spread neurons here and there, we decided to uh, take advantage of the human organoids uh, to see if we could study more uh, human specific mechanisms. And indeed, we could recapitulate the phenotype and um, actually study finally uh, which mechanism in human could be really associated to this type of periventricular heterotopia. Yeah. And to and to summarize it a bit, because this is also published, um, what we could um, figure out was that both uh, neural stem cells, you can see them from the morphology here that it's completely uh, um, altered compared to um, control cells, but also neuronal migration uh, was actually defective in this, uh, in, in these neurons. And I think what's the most important message from this story is the fact that we actually found a subpopulation of neurons uh, that has completely altered dynamics. So if in control uh, organisms, we have two type of um, movement, let's say dynamics of neurons, in the mutant uh, organisms, we found this additional cluster of cells, which had different type of movement. Why is that important? It's important because in patients uh, with periventricular heterotopia, the majority of neurons actually manage to go to the right place, and only a subpopulation of cells doesn't make it. So obviously, maybe we can find and we could have found the population of cells which is altered in patient. And indeed, when we look in uh, single cell um, data sequencing from this uh, from these organoids, we could find amongst the mutant neurons, so these are only neurons, these are control neurons, and the blue and the uh, green are fat for endaxos neurons, we could find a subpopulation of mutant cells here that we call altered neurons, uh, which have different molecular signatures. And uh, um, so we also kind of found the specific molecular signature, and we found kind of very usual suspect genes, namely uh, guidance molecules, so which obviously can have an important role in a neuronal migration disorder like robot 3 this is C or Ephrin. We also found a very interesting gene, so it's called GNG5, which was uh, only uh, staying in the alter neurons, so was expressed in the progenitors, going down in neurons, but staying in this alter population of neurons and a variety of synaptic genes. Uh, so we have actually uh, decided to, uh, to take advantage of this uh, uh, of these uh, studies to, uh, for example, explore the role of this protein, which is absolutely unknown, that is GNG5, and also later on we will tell you about more about uh, functional studies. So GNG5. And in the lab uh, study GNG5, you can see that it's usually expressed only in progenitors, while in our alter neurons is expressed as a mitochondrial protein. Uh, and what we did was just to push it, so to overexpress it, to see if we could recapitulate uh, some of the phenotype observed in the fat for endaxis uh, patients or uh, organoids. And indeed, by using both mouse and human organoids, we could see that the progenitors, the radial glia, are also um, uh, altered, as well as neurons in mouse and human organoids could be uh, a, a defect in migration. So basically, by just taking the highest expressed genes in this subpopulation of cells, Else, we could recapitulate some of the phenotype what we have observed in the patients. So uh, another couple of genes that we have been studying, and I will just tell you a few words about that, uh, are the pathway of Black AG6 and Rho A, and also MOB2. And um, interestingly, uh, the Black AG6 mutation, Black AG6 is an activator of Rho A, in human gives to give rise to periventricular heterotopia, uh, the mutation, while in um, the mouse models uh, uh, is associated with subcortical band heterotopia, or maybe even periventricular heterotopia is the 
debatable if it's a pH or SPH. Um, so when we look at the, uh, both mouse and organoids, we could see that the progenitors are affected very similarly uh, when we uh, downregulate like Ag6. But when we check about the uh, neuronal migration and uh, neuronal um, uh, movements, what we can see actually that human and mouse have basically opposite phenotypes because in um, in organics we have accumulation of neurons at the ventricles, while in uh, in the mouse we have faster migration and actually formation of cobblestone. So this is a discrepancy between the mouse model and the organoids. And I forgot to mention before that also in the fat for indexes uh, mutant, we had also not seen the hyperproliferation that we have seen in the mouse. So also one discrepancy in the fat for indexes mutant, one discrepancy also here in the plaque age six between mouse and models, uh, human model system. So um, to summarize the DAX and FET4 story, and this uh, it's important that we see uh, changes in the in the progenitor's identity, we see changes in the radial integrity, we see changes in neuronal dynamics. We can recapitulate with, by simply taking one very upregulated gene, some of the phenotypes, and we uh, can see something similar also in uh, other um, mutants. Um, we can recapitulate that also in other mutants for periventricular heterotopia. What is different between mouse and human is this progenitor's identity, which is exactly uh, the opposite. So in mouse, we have hyperproliferation. In human, we have premature differentiation. And the other one was the neuronal migration that we see that in mouse, um, neurons get faster and give rise to cobblestone, while in organoids tend to form um, uh, ectopic neurons at, uh, in germinal zones. So this is the first part. I just would like now to move to uh, two other mutations in which we actually figure out something more about cell non-autonomous mechanism and how these are correlated more with the cell fate and some evolutionary aspects. And so the first genes, uh, gene that I want to tell you about is Elgales GBP. This was also identified the first patient by uh, Stephen Robertson. So we have um, found three patients with mutation in exon 5 with periventricular heterotopia, normal of the CNS. We managed to get all the data for uh, two of the patients and with the help of Renzo Guarini, uh, we did a morphometric, he did a morphometric analysis, which resulted in, in two main uh, messages that uh, in these two patients, cortical thickness and gyrification index uh, was different. So this could be associated actually to changes in proliferation on one side and changes in uh, processes related to folding on the other side. And so that's why we look at expression in different species of this uh, uh, gene. And if we can see that initially in human, um, in fetal tissue, we have uh, the expression of uh, Galestrivip in a specific population of human cells, uh, which actually are really the radioglial cells, and in particular, these base radioglial cells. In mouse, is completely absent. In ferret, is actually enriched in the gyros compared to the sulcus. But also, if you look at uh, primates uh, and you compare organoids from different primates, uh, including human, chimp, and macaque, you can clearly see that also here, uh, in human, is, is high, highly expressed, while in, in chimp and also in macaque, the expression goes very much down. So suggesting with this expression that there is an evolutionary uh, role of Elgal S3BP uh, in uh, development. And so if you look even more carefully here, focusing on this space already at Lea, where we found that Elgal S3BP was enriched at a single cell level, but also uh, with the help of Alex Buffet's lab in Paris, uh, they did some staining for Elgal SGBP look very dirty it's just because it's in vesicles and they also found that it was enriched in the outer subventricular zone where we have basal radioglia. Uh, so we decided to generate uh, two mutations, um, not patient cells in this case, but we have exon 5 knockout, which recapitulated three mutations and one patient mutation. And what we did was uh, initially to just uh, characterize these organoids and, and just uh, figure out if they had some major differences, which uh, they definitely don't have. So there is no big difference in, in the number of progenitors, uh, PAX6 positive or intermediate progenitors, beta radioglia or neurons. What was actually striking was the fact that this uh, basal radioglia that are usually marked by this uh, OPEX 
in the Newton organoids were actually not always at basal position, like in this case, but many of them, they were staying at the ventricle. So suggesting actually that they don't manage to go to the right place. So they are generated. And indeed, when we quantify the total number, they are all there, uh, but they do not manage to go to the appropriate position. So we came to the conclusion that in this specific case, we have this uh, basal radioglia that they should go in this position that stay at the apical side. And this could have consequences for the neurons. So we decided to look at the neurons, of course, in these organoids. And again, uh, we found that in the mutants, we had a lot more neurons actually in the germinal zone, sometimes also with small cluster, not as clear as the, in the fat for indexes. And so we suspect uh, that the fact that these radioglia don't make it to this uh, uh, part where they usually expand and they generate neurons, which they have to take the other um, processes of the base radioglia and migrate, uh, they stay here because maybe they don't have, they're generated in the wrong place and they don't have the right guidance to go uh, and go to the right place. So mechanistically, we uh, we have been looking at these apical belts since they all stay at this uh, position. So when it overexpress this gene, uh, the cells delaminate. While uh, when we take the mutant, uh, the mutant organism they don't delaminate, and this is very much correlated with the expression of the apical belt here, which is usually at this apical side. You can see here that it's completely gone, and you can see that in the, in the mutant organism with a patient mutation, uh, this apical belt is very thick. So suggesting that this could be mechanically holding the cells and not let them delaminating and going to basal side. So uh, we decided to understand a little bit more about uh, um, how this uh, is happening. So we have uh, started by doing proteomic analysis. Uh, this is just a summary because uh, um, we have done it with all, obviously both mutants. Uh, so what we have seen by doing proteomic in this organoids is that um, we definitely impair uh, neuron development, generation of neurons, um, neurogenesis, but when we look at um, cellular components, what we uh, immediately notice that there is a lot about extracellular, so uh, extracellular space, vesicles, extracellular exosome, extracellular vesicles. And so we did the same analysis on the secreted medium, and we actually got very similar results. And the important thing for us, for us at this point was understanding who is responsible, so which population of cells is responsible for this change, are the progenitors or the neurons? And therefore, uh, with its single cell sequencing, with the help of uh, Barbara Freudlein's group, and what we first verified was that uh, there were uh, differences in the molecular signature of the space of radioglia, which actually seemed not to appear here. Um, what is, uh, but was, was very striking and what we wanted to figure out was if we see uh, this uh, extracellular changes in one specific subpopulation of cells. And indeed, we didn't observe that in neurons, but only in radioglial cells. So the same geotherm were coming up only for the radioglial cells. And in, in, uh, uh, together with that, many of the transfanin genes, they popped up to be uh, differentially regulated in uh, radioglial cells. And why is that interesting? Because these tetraspanin are transmembrane receptor of the vesicles which are secreted by the cells. And uh, therefore we process these vesicles to see if we are inside uh, LGAL STBP and by proteomic analysis, we found actually that it's inside of this vesicle. And in addition, we could see by doing immunostaining uh, that these are vesicles that they are really, um, so the, the immunostaining of a gallus TBP is really in this uh, small vesicle. So suggesting that it's um, expressed there, so it's going there and it's secreted. So obviously, if that's the case, or if all this mechanism mediated by its secreted uh, vesicle or secreted protein, uh, how can we um, how can we assess that? So we then decided to switch. Uh, the medium of the organoids every day uh, for quite a long time. And so to basically give control medium to the mutant organoids, and that uh, gave us uh, the chance to, to see if there was a rescue. So if the vesicles and the medium of the control could rescue the phenotype. And to make a long story short, we could rescue completely the phenotype for both uh, mutant. So, um, 
finally, we wanted to check the in vivo role of this Ergales GVP, and the mouse is the best way to test it because in the mouse is not expressed, and in the mouse there are no basal radioglia, almost no basal radioglia. So by simply expressing this in the mouse, we could see can we generate basal radioglia, are they functional basal radioglia? So the overexpression of this in mouse resulted in the formation of some weird cells located in a kind of an outer subventricular zone. So we were wondering if this is a real outer subventricular zone containing basal radioglia. And to uh, verify that, we wait a couple of days uh, longer. And what we could see is clearly that by just leaving this uh, couple of days longer, we had a formation of folds. Very interesting, these folds do not contain only green cells. So suggesting that the secretion of this molecule can also influence the surrounding cells and lead uh, to changes in the uh, in the cells. And so, um, so suggesting that this is more on non sol improving, that this is non solid autonomous mechanism. So finally, we wanted to see if also in the mouse, we can have exactly the same phenotype by not supplying the gene, but just supplying the vesicles containing this Elgalis TVP. So we um, generated exosomes containing either nothing or uh, only the, the plasmid, or Elgalis TVP control, or the two form of the uh, patients. Uh, we extract these exosomes and then we validate it and check if inside of this exosome Elgalis TVP was present. And in this is the case also for the mutant form, so suggesting that this mutant form also um, have um, Elgalis TVP that is secreted. And then we uh, slice a mouse brain, we sprinkle on top of the slices all these different combinations of exosomes. And again, to, um, to make it short, what we could find was an increase in basal radioglial cells and an increase in neurons at the ventricle. So really suggesting that what we have observed until now is really mediated uh, by um, everything that is packed in these vesicles. So um, keeping this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, extracellular mediated uh, mechanism, we also study another gene, which is called EC2, which is actually very little expressed in human, but highly in, uh, in mice. And uh, what we could see by study, so we started by looking at that in mice, and what we could see, you can see the green cells and you can see where is the uh, nodules um, of progenitors here, but there are also no, a lot of nodules of uh, uh, neurons or a set of progenitors and nodules of neurons. And we can clearly see again a very non-cell autonomous phenotype uh, because all the phenotype is also very much in non-green uh, uh, non, uh, cells. And we also use the organoids to model this, and we could recapitulate some of the mechanisms that we have seen before, uh, namely this detachment from the apical side, uh, changes in the apical belt, and uh, again, when, when we did proteomic analysis in the organoids uh, from uh, mutant for the CC2, we could find a lot of extracellular matrix pro protein, really suggesting that also in this mutant patient, probably the environment and the secretion is the one uh, that is the most important for uh, the phenotype. So to summarize the second part um, and focusing on Elgalis TVP, we know that it's secreted in exosome, modified extracellular space, leads to basal radioglia, then in turn uh, lead to uh, the formation of the folds, and this um, influence the position of migrating neurons, and we can see something similar non-cell autonomous mechanism by looking at EC2. And all this um, phenotype together could clearly explain what we see in the patient, namely ectopic neurons changing in the size in certain cases, uh, genification uh, changes, uh, and seizure. And, and last, I really want to spend two minutes, I hope I'm not too late, uh, in, uh, in telling you about uh, um, how we are trying now to understand more about functional me mechanisms. So can we model with the organoids something more functional? So we have aged the organoids for a while. Uh, now they are, uh, the, the, the recording that we have done, they are approximately on one year old organoids. You can see that they are not as pretty as before. Uh, there are a lot of, um, a lot of uh, disorganization. They are not with this nice ventricle, but still the cells that need to be there, they are quite represented. represented. Uh, so uh, we also profile the factor and axis organoid. That's what we have started with, but we have also in the pipeline and Gallus 3 um, 
we profile them and what we can see are changing in um, brain development, in projection development, axon development and synapses. So keeping kind of similar changes of what we have observed uh, uh, two months old organoids. And uh, we have established with the help of the core facility in Munich, uh, electrophysiology core facility that were institute, silico problem extracellular recording. We can see that they are functional, we can stimulate it, um, we can block uh, receptors, um, and the MDA receptor and GABA receptor with the agonist and antagonist. And, and, and quite preliminary, we can see clearly already by showing this, this simple plot of the movies uh, that uh, uh, there are changes in the, uh, in the uh, recording of these organoids. We see change in the number of spikes between control and mutant. And especially what we see is that we can see much more high frequency spikes compared to the low frequency spikes. I don't know how much we can correlate this with um, possible seizure or hyperactivity or whatever in patients, uh, but so we now, the big question is now to understand if this extracellular signal that we have means alter network is correlated to the architecture of the organoid. So namely, we have neurons in the wrong place or a function of this neuron. So, and that's why we are now patching these cells to local intracellular recording. So with that, uh, I would come to a very complex summary slides, uh, which you don't have to read, just to say there are quite some similarities in these phenotypes. You can see I highlighted some words. For NPC, we have a lot of morphology delamination changes. For neurons in both mouse and human, we have a lot of migration and pH. Uh, we have also a lot of common mechanisms, cytoskeletal changes, cilia changes, exosome changes, non autonomous uh, but what we also have are differences. So in mouse, for example, we often we have always this delay neurogenesis in humans. Sometimes we have premature neurogenesis. In mouse, we have a lot of differences in what you, what we see as a changes in the migration, slower, slower folds, uh, defect nodules, slower, faster. Uh, while in human, there seems to be more consistent on defect and and slow type of migration. So uh, and there are also some kind of pathway that they are absolutely not recapitulated. In human. So just to say, the both model systems are very useful to uh, come to conclusion. So we hope that by studying several genes, uh, we have highlighted some of the uh, possible uh, layers in between, uh, and uh, we will understand more by studying more genes. So with that, I come to uh, the uh, conclusion. So this is my lab, all the people that have uh, passed to my lab in the last five years. These are the present people, uh, but also all the uh, people that have been there before they have contributed to all these projects. So you've seen I presented several projects. So there is not one specific person, but everybody. And these are the most important uh, people also, the collaborators in the Institute, but also especially important clinician uh, radiologists people also of the consortium that have been uh, very important collaborators, uh, um, like Renzo and Steven, uh, a lot of omics people like Bar the group of Barbara and Stefan Sieber, Alex Buffet from Paris for human tissue. I'm very grateful for this interaction of the NeuroMig that uh, initiated a lot of new collaboration. And I also would like to mention that, uh, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, inspiring uh, interaction with a few labs have been uh, very, very important. And, and, and uh, so in particular, the lab of Fiona Francis, uh, Laurent Nguyen, Stephanie Baulac, Denisha Boudon, and JB Manon are very important to, uh, you know, keep exchanging ideas and, you know, refine also experiments. So they're also uh, important people for uh, this project. And thank you very much for your attention. So basically, um, um, I'm, uh, yeah, presenting today about uh, DNA methylation based classification of MCD. Um, this is a slightly different talk to what you've heard uh, so far. So, so far, we've heard a lot about uh, mechanistic studies, very, very in-depth studies uh, on, on the molecules involved uh, in uh, proliferation, migration, and so on, the, the mechanisms that contribute to um, MCD uh, development. But uh, my talk will be focused more on the diagnosis of MCD 
and here specifically on the back end of diagnosing MCD, because uh, most of you, uh, when thinking about diagnosing, think about uh, MRI imaging and, and genetic studies. Um, but uh, in case, cases at least that are amenable to epilepsy surgery, um, there is uh, still uh, the second part of the diagnostic workup on the histopathological um, evaluation of, of the tissue and, and also um, my work is focused on the identification of molecular markers um, that help with uh, diagnosis. And um, for the histopathology part, uh, we have uh, started uh, uh, quite some time ago um, to move into uh, digital neuropathology because the problem is that um, um, the di diagnosing from, from, from uh, histology is uh, not straightforward just like it is uh, for, for the MRI imaging. So there are sometimes uh, overlapping um, histomorphological features in different um, disease entities. And uh, to distinguish that is really a matter of uh, a lot of experience. And even in exper uh, from uh, experienced neopathologists, um, there is a, a difficulty to, to distinguish some of these um, entities. So what we've tried to do is um, to use um, something that I will now call artificial intelligence, although it is not artificial intelligence, but um, it just means that we try to um, diagnose uh, with the help of the computer, let's say. So um, starting from uh, digitized uh, whole slide images uh, from routine histo um, immunistic chemistry, like here, HNE stains. Uh, we then uh, feed a, a convolutional neural network uh, as the basis uh, of, of um, um, classifier um, that um, yeah, is trained uh, for um, or in a supervised learning task to distinguish um, different disease entities. And so um, our poster child for, for this uh, work was a study where we tried to distinguish um, FCD type 2B and tuberous sclerosis, which, as you know, are not that difficult to distinguish from a clinical point of view. If you have an MRI image and have a genetic test, then it's much easier to distinguish these two. But if um, the samples arrive in the neuropathology and we don't know anything else about the clinical uh, uh, details, then what we are faced with is uh, uh, immunistic chemistry that looks very um, similar between these uh, two entities. So both have uh, dysmorphic neurons and balloon cells as histopathological hallmarks. And only experienced neuropathologists have something like a gut feeling that tells them what makes the difference between the two. And so here we, um, the idea is if we use uh, digital neuropathology and, and the uh, artificial intelligence, then we can actually objectify this type of diagnosis because the neuropathologist cannot tell me what his gut feeling is all about, whereas um, the computer, I can actually ask what it trained on. And this is what we did. So um, you can use these type of uh, GRADCAM analysis uh, uh, where um, basically it's highlighted uh, what uh, features um, the, the neural network trained on. And then you can actually um, get also some information back from the computer and uh, uh, learn um, histological details uh, about different entities that you maybe were not aware of. And that this is really useful um, was tested in a, in a little trial. So we actually um, had um, 20 FCD type 2B cases and TSC cases um, that were evaluated by experts. Um, and evaluated by non-experts, so people who are not working in neuropathology and not involved in diagnosis um, every day. And um, you can see in this graph on, on the right that the non-experts in the first round, without any help and training, um, uh, performed very badly. But when we gave them the information from this uh, GRADCAM analysis, uh, together with some sort of um, grading uh, in terms of, you know, which features are more important than others, uh, we developed some sort of uh, point system that, that could be assigned. And um, then with this uh, help, the non-experts actually in the second round of evaluation of these cases um, uh, performed quite well, almost on the level of the experts. So here we have uh, basically a quick way of uh, teaching people um, um, like, like a 
time zoom uh, through 30 years of experience uh, and, and give them the knowledge that they need to distinguish um, different pathologies. And this work has been published. And um, as I said, this was just like uh, our poster child uh, on that this type of uh, application is useful. Um, but we are now expanding this, of course, on, on other entities where it makes um, even more sense. Um, this brings me to the actual part of, of my talk. So um, I'm uh, uh, more interested in uh, identifying molecular signatures that help um, disease classification and um, diagnosis. Um, and as you are aware of, um, there has been a lot of uh, there have been a lot of genetic studies that were able uh, to assign germline and more recently somatic variants to specific. Uh, brain malformations and, and help with some uh, grouping of, of brain malformations, just like, for instance, the uh, variants that have been identified to, to uh, mTOR and uh, mTOR-related uh, genes uh, and have been associated with uh, focal cortical dysplasia type 2, for instance. Um, but um, this is uh, not really my, my uh, area of expertise, but uh, I'm more working on um, epigenetic signatures. Um, I started uh, with mechanistic questions, but then moved into um, disease classification because, um, as I will show you in a second, um, this really makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with epigenetics, I'll just have a short um, uh, introduction to, to the topic. Um, so what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is the unseen operator of our genome. So it's basically like the man outside of this uh, figure bringing these puppets to life. This is what epigenetics is to the genome. So it brings our genome to life. It, it introduces um, a lot of, um, let's say, signposting that then decides how um, genes are switched on and off. And it's a group of biochemical processes, um, which I will not all mention, but um, I will focus on DNA methylation because this is um, what I'm working on. Why consider epigenetics? Um, I think uh, everybody should have that in mind uh, because epigenetics is active in any cell type uh, at any time. So uh, in, in physiological and pathological conditions, it's associated with uh, different disease states. Um, it is um, versatile in terms of uh, it responds to, to intrinsic and uh, extrinsic uh, stimuli. So it's uh, also our way of adapting to um, our environment to lifestyle and behavior and and um, all of this leaves um, an epigenetic signature in our cells and changes uh, gene expression and um, as I said, I concentrate on. I want to concentrate on DNA methylation. So, what does DNA methylation do? Um, it is very important for uh, genome stability because it silences uh, retrotransposons and uh, repetitive elements. It's also important for gene dosage compensation, so allelic imprinting, X chromosome inactivation, things like that. It's also um, basically biology's feature number one to inactivate developmental genes. It's very stable, long-term, uh, over 100 years, um, this type of uh, silencing can work, which doesn't mean that it is irreversible because as you can see on the right, there's also a way of removing uh, DNA methylation and, and re-establish unmethylated uh, cytosines. There are active and path, uh, passive ways of uh, demethylation. Um, and uh, so this is just to tell you that uh, epigenetics by nature is reversible, which makes it also an interesting target for uh, treatment, but that's not the topic for today. The topic for today is that it's also a valuable source um, of uh, biomarkers um, for diagnosis, for prognosis, and also for, for prediction of treatment response. Um, so when I started to, to analyze DNA methylation, I basically started uh, at a single gene level, found uh, associations between uh, altered DNA methylation in, in some gene promoters and um, subsequent uh, silencing of this gene. Um, but there was always the question whether this is a, a really um, uh, 
master switch for, for gene regulation in epilepsy. And so in my first studies, um, which were uh, still focused more on, on uh, focal epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis, um, I uh, studied different animal models uh, and, and used uh, next generation sequencing to um, study the whole uh, the genomic DNA methylation profile. And what you can see in this figure is that um, whatever model we studied, and uh, here are three different ones, um, you can always distinguish uh, healthy control animals marked in green from the epileptogenic or epileptic animals marked in uh, pink. And um, you see um, the, in the yellow and the blue is, is the methylation uh, of specific uh, genomic regions. So each row is a genomic region with its particular um, methylation profile. Um, and you can really see it's like uh, black and white, um, the genomic DNA methylation uh, uh, signatures. Um, and so that was like the first idea that we can actually use DNA methylation uh, to, to diagnose um, uh, um, epilepsy, but also, as you can see, different etiologies associated uh, with epilepsy, because uh, these uh, three different models um, share the general feature that DNA methylation is different between epilepsy and controls, but when you integrate the different data sets, you will find that there's uh, more differences between these uh, three animal models uh, than, than uh, similarities. The similarities are uh, summarized here on the right, um, showing that, of course, there is some general feature distinguishing just the seizure phenotype from the from the control, but um, as these models have different clinical representation, this really um, uh, is uh, also represented in the methylation profile because it's very specific in these different um, etiologies. But then the idea was, okay, if this works in, in animal models, uh, let's see whether we can also uh, use this um, uh, for diagnostic purposes in, in human samples. And uh, at that uh, time, the, the revised ILAE FCD classification came out and was clear that um, it's highly complex. There are nine different subtypes of, of FCD uh, described so far. Some are very well described, like the FCD type 2, but then others like the FCD type 1A or the type 3 FCDs, they uh, lack uh, comprehensive um, description of the histopathological hallmarks. And um, so the idea was uh, to check whether DNA methylation uh, really makes also a difference in these uh, patient groups. So this was our very first study, small study uh, for the proof of concept, and we analyzed um, autopsy control uh, um, samples uh, and compared them to different uh, groups of uh, focal epilepsy patients with different uh, pathologies. And what you can see in the first uh, column is that all the controls um, are always uh, distinguishable from all the epilepsy samples uh, by their genomic DNA methylation signature. And if you uh, continue the pairwise comparisons between the disease groups, you see that they are always different from one another. So really, um, that was the, the proof for us that DNA methylation is pathology specific and can be used for, for diagnostic purposes. Um, this was a study that uh, was still using uh, next generation sequencing of methylation uh, um, enriched uh, DNA. Uh, so, um, it is, uh, was a very interesting study also for me mechanistic purposes, but what I wanted to show you here is that um, we also learned from this study that basically most of the action of DNA methylation changes is taking place way outside of, of uh, genes. So zero, it marks here the transcriptional start site, and uh, the majority of changes is taking uh, place far away from the transcriptional start site. Um, and uh, um, this is uh, really interesting to explore, and but also shows you the complexity of the whole system. If you really want to make uh, mechanistic sense out of these signals, um, that's that's uh, uh, difficult to address um, because it's not um, a very uh, direct uh, uh, association with the gene expression. But uh, what this figure also shows you um, was uh, the result from an in silico analysis because there are other ways of studying genomic DNA methylation like these arrays. The 450K array uh, was the first generation and the 850K array is uh, now the current um, 
uh, uh, generation of, of methylation uh, arrays from, from Illumina. And we wanted to check how much of the information that we found by the sequencing approach was also uh, captured by uh, if we would have used uh, the array approach. And you can see that a lot of information would be just uh, missing because these areas are not well represented on the arrays. Nevertheless, these arrays are very interesting because they are used in um, uh, brain tumors uh, for disease classification and so we wanted uh, to do um, a test whether these uh, areas are still useful also for disease classification in um, epilepsy and uh, so we um, started another uh, uh, um, study where we focused uh, again on a number of uh, FCD subtypes here, FCD type 2 A and 2 B, but also included um, other uh, uh, MCD groups like the hemimagallencephalis here and uh, quite a large group of polymicrogyria cases. Um, and uh, basically the first finding was that uh, even with the array, we are able to distinguish um, different disease groups. We also here again have our temporal lobe epilepsy patients um, with hippocampal sclerosis, but here we used, um, just like in the study before, um, not the hippocampus, but, but the adjacent normal appearing temporal neocortex. So from an architectural point of view or, or lamination point of view, um, this cortex is intact. So you would say it looks healthy, but uh, as we know, these patients have epilepsy. Um, this uh, distinguishes um, this group from, from the uh, non-epilepsy controls shown here. And so, yeah, we recapitulated um, um, this finding of, of uh, um, uh, classification based on DNA methylation, but was uh, what was interesting uh, further when we looked at this was the group of polymicrogyria patients here. Um, because we had some subgrouping uh, within the PMG um, cases and we were wondering what this actually uh, meant. And uh, when we performed from these DNA methylation data, um, you can basically also do something like a copy number analysis. It's like a SNP array. Um, and what you see then is uh, that in these uh, particular patients, um, who, who belong to this small subgroup here, we identified this uh, uniform duplication of the entire long arm of chromosome 1. So um, this had never been um, uh, described uh, before in, in, in uh, polymicrogyria. Um, and uh, so we explored that further and checked uh, with fish analysis whether we really see this, this uh, trisomy of uh, 1Q. And as you can see here with the red uh, label, um, that's uh, the, the um, mark for the, for the 1Q and the green is, is for the 1P. Uh, and you, you really see that in the center of the lesion, you see this trisomy. Then we checked also the perilesional tissue um, as we had that available. So where we didn't see any... Uh, um, uh, where we didn't have any evidence for polymicrogyria. And in the perilational tissue, you don't see this trisomy. So it was really a, a, a mutation or, or a copy number gain here um, that uh, associated uh, with the lesion. Then we were asking what this... Um, what clinical associations we, we could make uh, with, with this uh, chromosomal uh, imbalance. And uh, we checked the MRIs, of course, and we found that, um, surprisingly, in these uh, patients with this uh, very large uh, uh, duplication, um, you find rather uh, focal um, lesions uh, of polymicrogyria. You don't find um, that was really clear. You don't find any association with hemimegalencephaly. So other PMG uh, cases where we had also the PMG as part of a hemimegalencephaly all belong to the non-mutated uh, or, or non-duplication group here. Um, histologically, you also see differences because um, really you just see an isolated uh, polymicrogyria, whereas in these other cases you see um, uh, nodular heterotopias and, and uh, focal cortical dysplasia also associated. Um, then when you look into the um, seizure onset, um, the group with the PMG1Q trisomy um, uh, had a much, much earlier uh, seizure onset, so at the age of, of four months, uh, the mean, and um, the other uh, group had a seizure onset at the age of 
too, but also with the very uh, large um, uh, um, variance. Whereas the duration of epilepsy was um, uh, equal in both groups. And uh, what we also found is that these patients um, had a, a very severe developmental delay affecting cognition, speech, uh, and motor. Um, so for us, this was like um, interesting in many ways. Uh, one that uh, we validated that DNA methylation can be used for disease classification, that it also gives us a hint on the uh, genotype, um, and that it also helps us to identify new patient groups like this one here that has been uh, very uh, nicely described. Uh, altogether, we identified seven um, out of 26 uh, PMG patients uh, with this um, one q trisomy. And this brings me to, to the next step. So um, uh, basically, now that we have shown that these arrays can be used for disease classification also in, in epilepsy, we actually aim to develop uh, something like a, a, a classifier that is um, usable by, by a broader audience, um, just like this has been shown for um, brain tumors. Uh, so two years ago, uh, the group in um, Heidelberg uh, showed together with many other uh, colleagues across the globe that uh, DNA methylation can be used to classify um, the very large group of, of uh, brain tumors. Um, including also brain tumors that are associated with uh, epilepsy. Um, they, dis, uh, they were able to uh, distinguish over 80 different um, uh, disease entities. And um, also with uh, every um, update of this classifier, they've been able to introduce new um, entities um, that are well ca characterized now, not only by their DNA methylation, but also by associated um, uh, specific uh, genetic findings um, like uh, copy number variations and, and gene fusions and uh, think, things like that. And um, the, uh, this type of classifier really introduces some sort of uh, objective measure into uh, um, uh, neuropathology and, and helps to uh, refine um, diagnosis, uh, to change diagnosis, and, and really also um, uh, makes a difference, at least in tumors, also for the, for the treatment of some of these tumors. Um, so with this in mind, we tried to set up something like this for the for the group of cortical malformations. And so uh, we took from our European Epilepsy Brain Bank uh, as many uh, MCD um, uh, as possible, uh, representing um, major groups, as you can see here in the in the figure legend. So we have uh, all the FCD subtypes uh, that are available um, covered. We ha have uh, also um, new disease entities like the Morgan that has only been recently introduced, uh, also covered polymicrogyria, MMCDs and, and others. Um, that uh, you are familiar with. And uh, basically what you can immediately capture from this figure is um, that all these uh, MCD subtypes can be distinguished based on their DNA methylation signature. This is just the simplified uh, dimensionality reduction um, showing you the different uh, uh, clusters uh, according to DNA methylation. But then you can, of course, in this heat map, look into the details and actually um, see how um, these signatures um, are different between the different disease groups. Uh, and again, uh, something that I've said already, um, the first distinction here is between um, autopsy controls and all epilepsy cases, and only then on a second uh, notice we have this distinction of the um, different uh, MCD groups. Um, of course, there are a lot of uh, factors that affect DNA methylation, uh, like age and um, also location and uh, yeah, gray or white matter, also sex, things like that. So uh, we try to um, correct for all these uh, confounders and that was very efficient as, uh, as summarized in here. So none of our um, clusters are uh, uh, driven by, by these uh, specific um, features. Um, just like in the um, digital neuropathology approach, uh, also here we try to um, get a more uh, uh, um, uh, 
let's say, advanced uh, method of, of uh, clustering and, and classification. So uh, we used a deep learning approach. Again, we used a neural net uh, that was trained to make the distinction between our disease groups. The clusters here look slightly different, but still you see it's, it's very nice. Um, the good thing is that here we can also uh, test our model for, for its uh, uh, specificity um, and um, so we did this uh, precision and recall and, and uh, test and we can see that uh, basically um, in our validation cohort, um, um, the, the uh, assignment to the different disease classes is, is very efficient. Also uh, in the normalized confusion metrics, you see the same results. So if the um, annotated label is the same as the predicted label. You get this nice um, diagonal here, and you can see that there's only like uh, one uh, sample that was not uh, uh, correctly uh, labeled um, or predicted um, uh, by this uh, model here. And then also you see that uh, basically our controls, which we have, which we have still um, separated into uh, neocortex and white matter, um, actually in our model uh, form uh, a uniform cluster, not two different clusters. And this uh, explains um, the, the uh, overlap here in, in the prediction and annotation. Um, we also used a, a test cohort, so data that had never been been seen by our um, neural net work or by our model uh, before. Uh, we used samples from an ILAD, uh, ILAE FCD um, agreement trial, which uh, was taking place uh, um, over the last uh, two years, I think. Um, there have been many different neuropathologists uh, involved uh, over the world um, to uh, classify um, FCD cases um, and, and non-FCD cases uh, and um, they have undergone I think four different rounds of, of uh, diagnosis and, and still uh, for some cases it was very difficult to get an agreement on, on the final diagnosis so you see it's, it's really uh, tricky and, and not trivial but the good news is that our uh, network um, is um, basically able to assign all, all cases uh, correctly to their um, disease groups. So really we think that this is an application uh, in the future if we increase the sample size and, and can, can really uh, show the valid validity of uh, this uh, approach, then this is something that we want to introduce um, to, an, let's say, uh, open access uh, online platform and, and, and make this really accessible to the broader community. Um, what is also interesting is that um, uh, all this data that I've showed you is uh, so, um, was uh, basically using a, a quite large number of uh, CPG sites in the genome, uh, which is still a lot of information, but we tried to break it down to how much information do we actually need to get our classification uh, uh, and our, our DNA methylation clusters. And uh, we broke it down to basically 367 CPG sites in the entire genome that are enough to distinguish our um, disease groups. You only see like uh, two outliers, one here and one here, um, that didn't make it into their original group. But other than that, uh, the majority of, of our 300 cases are really uh, assigned uh, where they belong. And this is interesting for a more targeted approach uh, if you want to um, maybe also uh, translate this these findings into something that is even more interesting because right now we've been working in, in brain tissue but of course everybody says yeah but um, I would like to have this information before surgery or even in cases that are not amenable to epilepsy surgery so the idea still is maybe we can find um, some DNA methylation signatures also in the blood of these patients that would help us um, to, to give us some information on, on what's going on in the brain. And uh, for these purposes, we need uh, very uh, sensitive techniques to, to detect these DNA methylation profiles. Um, and so if we have something like a reduced number of CPG sites that we need to um, uh, only uh, uh, 
detect, then we can actually uh, establish more targeted approaches than uh, such an array and, and maybe find the signatures we're looking for. So this brings me basically to the outlook uh, and to the end of, of this talk. So what we are now working on is um, that um, we, of course, want to use these type of information also to get some mechanistic understanding um, uh, of our, our MCD and, and we want to understand what specific epigenetic marks do, um, but that's not relevant for the diagnostic part that's just for the for the scientific part um, then of course we are trying to identify epigenetic marks now uh, from blood uh, not yet from CSF but um, that could be also a solution and um, then we also want to test in future studies the predictive value of these um, signatures because as I showed you for the PMG we do have some evidence that DNA methylation also tells us something about the genotype. This is also true for the brain tumors. Similar uh, findings have been reported there. So the idea is maybe we can, um, I don't know, save a lot of money <laughs> if we um, use DNA methylation signatures to, to predict genotype. And if we could do any, any predictions of treatment response, this would be just a, a phenomenon. Yeah, and um, with this, I come to an end. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, listing all my uh, titles and my job description, I do have many <laughs> um, yeah, duties, and sometimes also getting the impression that I cannot get any of them. Nevertheless, I'm very happy to open the day second and also to uh, start the clinical session. In fact, this is what we are going to discuss today in um, regarding the lysencephaly. We start with the clinic, with the definition, with the characteristic, the ways to recognize lysencephaly. Uh, we talk about um, genetic um, changes that can lead to lysencephaly and the best uh, patient um, testing strategies. And at the end, I still want to go back to their um, basic mechanisms and discuss with you um, what is actually happening in the brain, what leads to the to lysencephaly, and how it may help us to uh, think about new therapeutical approach if we have any hope to be able to treat these patients in, in the future. Um, yeah, so I'll start right away with definition. We define this encephaly as a spectrum of malformations with abnormal gyration. Uh, it includes at least three entities. Um, the, mo at the most severe end we have gyria um, that represents um, the absence of the gyri. So as you may see here, um, it goes through the pachygyria, um, they're uh, representing the very um, presence of the few gyri, but they're very broad and clearly um, different, um, giving different picture uh, comparing to the normal brain. And um, up there at the at least clinically less severe end is their subcortical vampire repair. The disorder that looks quite different and quite striking. We also have the reduced gyration here. If we look at the cortical um, uh, surface, or at the brain surface, and um, but there is a big difference to the gyri and pachygyria since it's not only abnormal gyration, but here at least at these two pictures we see a clearly abnormally thick cortex in the co in the cortex of cortical banditotopia, the cortical ribbon. It appears almost normal in, or even thin, thin um, but just after the cortical ribbon, we have a second layer of um, gray matter, and sometimes also called double cortex. Here, you need to be careful that um, this structure has nothing to do with cortex, it's just a disorganized uh, layer of uh, cortical uh, of the neurons that couldn't make it uh, all the way through to the cortex. Um, again, back to the definition of lysencephaly, um, important uh, to remember that the lysencephaly is not just abnormal duration. If we would have a normal um, a live um, meeting, I would probably ask you to walk 
and raise your hands uh, if you think that any of these pictures or, or any of these two pictures represent listing safely. But here I just need to um, solve the puzzle myself. The first picture um, represents abnormal duration impact. It's simplified in a patient with the severe microcephaly. But the second picture is actually a normal picture of their um, fetal um, duration at the 36 um, week of gestation, where the brain development is still on the way. And that's why we see a reduced number of gyres with the normal cortical thickness. And this is the important um, point always to keep in mind when you call um, a cortical malformation in this encephaly, that their cortex is always thickened in this encephaly. What does it mean in numbers? Uh, well, the normal cortex has a thickness of 3 to 4 millimeters, uh, with a few examples depending on the location. Um, the lysencephalic cortex can go up to 10 to 20 millimeters. Um, and in the so-called thick pathogenia. Well, in fact, every pathogenia is thick, but this type of pathogenia is really thick. And there is a second um, subtype called um, what we call now pathogenia lysencephaly with 5 to 10 millimeter cortical thickness. We used to call it thin lysencephaly, but trying to meet this term now because it's confusing since the cortex is not thin, it's still thicker than normal. Um, it's important also to, of course, to recognize the list encephaly on the MRI and also distinguish it from the other cortical malformations. So what are the malformations that list encephaly can be confused with? Well, the first one is polymicrogyria. You might wonder why, since the polymicrogyria per definition doesn't mean reduced um, gyration, but increased and um, excessive gyration. But if you look carefully at the cortex, at the cortical region here, on the MRI at the deep appeared thickened due to excessive microgyry. Um, but uh, what helps us to differentiate and be sure what we call pachygyria, what we call polymicrogyria, is the cortical surface and the, and the appearance of the gray-white malta boundary um, that is smooth, both uh, actually parameters are smooth in pachygyria, and um, it's um, uneven and pebbled and strippled in polymicrogyria. The same um, criteria help us to distinguish this encephaly from the, from the cobblestone malformation, a malformation that historically was even called this encephaly type 2. Why? Because macroscopical brain, uh, the brain from the disease patient, deceased patient, <laughs> sorry, um, indeed look very similar, very smooth, and even if we look at this uh, image, you just see the reduced gyration. Uh, if you pay close attention to the great um, white gray um, matter boundary, here you see there, um, the signs that help us um, to distinguish these two malformations. In case of cobblestone, we don't see this smooth uh, border, but we see their um, perpendicular and neuronal columns that goes from the cortical surface to the middle of the brain. Here we see the same picture, and this is a pathognomonic uh, <clears throat> feature of the cobblestone malformation. Um, it's important to distinguish this malformation since they do have totally different mechanisms and also different genes involved in um, their development. Um, besides uh, the MRI, that is, of course, remains our main tool to diagnose this encephaly, we can also um, get uh, the same diagnosis from the neuropathology. Uh, here, I would like to refer you to the excellent review of our neuromic uh, colleagues, uh, Stephanie Brock um, and the group of Anne Janssen, which appeared, I guess, just probably one month ago online. And I guess you would also have a, uh, a talk um, tomorrow given, uh, from uh, Stephanie, giving the review of this um, uh, literature uh, summary. And uh, not to <laughs> be a spoiler, I want to, of course, focus on the listens happily. And um, their summary of the whole work is that our knowledge about the neuropathological uh, findings in listens happily or in malformation and cortical development in general is very limited. 
for the lysencephaly, only six genetically defined forms have um, detailed uh, literature information about um, what we see in histology. Histologically, we could define um, four, four layers of lysencephaly, two layers of lysencephaly, and three layers of lysencephaly um, in, in case of the IREX variant. Um, I guess this cartoon uh, helps to understand uh, this uh, layering problem better. Um, again, here, if you look at this cartoon, um, basically the only uh, preserved or kind of preserved uh, layer is the first layer, molecular layer, uh, with the few of uh cells in it. The rest of the uh, layers do not correspond to the uh, layers of the normal cortical structure, and in some cases, it's just a bunch of disorganized um, neurons. Um, and um, at least um, as far as we know, uh, for this limited um, data we have, um, the histological pattern of this encephaly has a, uh, shows a clear phenotype-genotype um, correlation. So every genetic form has its own pathology. And we just need to work harder to distinguish uh, or to explore the rest of the neuropathological findings. Um, so the limited data will be available for four more genes. Here's one example, a very recent publication, um, showing their um, um, pathological pattern, probably again comparable with the polar encephaly in a patient with the ACTG1 variant. And um, at least two thirds of this encephaly gene basically have no neuropathological data available to allow. Uh, of course, um, we don't start um, working with the patients just requesting an MRI. Something must be wrong with this baby <laughs> to get an early imaging. So what can be wrong? How this patient present? The vast majority of these patients will have abnormal development. Very early in, in life, in the first weeks or even just after birth, they present with hypotonia. They may have small sets of components, but not necessarily. Some um, um, patients start also to develop seizures, some of them as early as um, the first months of life, um, and the vast majority of them do have seizures by age of 10. Um, they do not meet their development the milestones. Um, at least um, in time, our, some patients will never reach certain development though. Myelin's tones, for example, as independent walking or um, free talking. Um, and um, in, as a general rule, these patients do not have associated anomalies. They don't have malformations of other organs, and they do look pretty normal. Again, with two exceptions, if you look at this girl with the Barrett-Simmons disorder frontofacial syndrome, she does have a clear um, a, 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 a number of minor anomalies. That is all that are already suggested for her underlying syndrome, uh, together with their her pathogenia, and there are also uh, characteristic facial features in Medica syndrome. Um, the associated anomalies is in the uh, excellent encephaly with ambiguous genitalia, and patients patients may also have other um, abnormalities. There are also a few exceptions from the moderate to severe intellectual disabilities. Um, for example, um, female patients with DCX variants might have um, normal or nearly normal um, intellectual um, level. The same patients, um, patients with the crowd associated with encephaly may be only borderline or very mildly affected. Um, some patients can be diagnosed clinically, however, the clear um, or the clinical diagnosis of this encephaly is possible only very late in pregnancy, or at least the definite clinical diagnosis. Um, these patients do offer few abnormalities even before, um, mess, mo mostly that would be early ventricularly, and the presence of the non cortical brain malformations. Uh, how do we test patients once we suspect it, this patient is having this encephaly? Um, doesn't matter of their form of this encephaly. Um, we um, 
um, suggest to proceed with our general um, roadmap um, developed for all malformations of cortical development. And uh, we, since we do know um, associated with this encephaly, it's better to test them all in one shot. So we need a genome-wide approach. Um, depending on their um, method used in the laboratory, if you can um, order a genome um, sequencing, you might need, you don't need probably to order a chromosomal microarray, but you need to remember to ask for the careful copy number variations, as uh, micro deletions is also an important part of the um, lysencephaly etiology. Um, there are a few examples uh, from this um, general rule uh, of the genome-wide testing. The, of course, the recognition of the pathognomonic picture. And one of these pathognomonic pictures is a diffuse, thick pan heterotopia, basically the picture seen at this image. If you see this MRI image, there is only gene, there is one gene to test. It's DCX, and you shouldn't uh, forget to have a careful copy number analysis from DCX as well. The other uh, specific part is um, this um, package area of the, the cortical thickness 5 to 10 millimeters in combination with the severe demyelinization and complete absence of the corpus callosum seen in a male patient. This is very suggestive um, with basically 100% diagnostic yield for their um, uh, loss of function variants in the IRX gene. There is other patterns that may be suggestive for a group of genes. Um, as you see here, again, uh, listen carefully with the um, cortical thickness 5 to 10 millimeters in combination with the severe cerebellar hyperplasia and also hippocampal dysplasia. You see also severe um, cerebellar hyperplasia here involved in both uh, cerebellar varmis and cerebellar hemispheres, the responsible gene can be relin or can be also a relin receptor gene called BLDLR. Just uh, MRI presentation does not allow us to tell whether we expect variants in this gene or in another gene, but if you still, and since the gene are quite large, you might still um, go for a genome-wide testing, but at least the lab will be appreciating very much in their possibility um, to focus on, on one or two particular genes instead of doing blind <laughs> genome-wide search. Um, the few uh, recently described um, lysencephaly forms have also um, shown specific presentation. Here we see a so-called abrupt transition from um, mildly abnormal, um, we can even say um, nearly normal cortex in the frontal lobes to the complete agaria seen in the back. And um, this pattern was seen in um, a recessive form of lysencephaly associated with the variants in the APC2 gene, and also in the dominant form of lysencephaly um, with variants, um, with heterozygous variants in uh, CYP85L gene. Again, the pattern is suggestive, but we cannot really tell whether we uh, and should look here or here, so, but um, of course it helps to prioritize the variants um, in the lab if um, the clinician recognized the pattern and mentioned particular release genes. Here, I guess I'm um, almost through uh, of the, um, for the clinical part of the talk. And I would like to um, discuss or show you what is our current knowledge about the disease mechanisms in this encephaly. Um, well, we call it a classic neuronal migration disorder. And indeed, there are multiple evidence that suggesting that um, these neurons are not moving properly. Again, I refer to another um, excellent review from the NeuroMeet group published in 2018. And I allowed myself to modify it, um, this figure uh, just to be able to focus on this encephaly. And um, here you may see um, the three uh, major groups, ben heterotopia and agaria and pachygeria, as well as um, another subgroup, microlysencephaly, 
of micro, uh, micro listen cephaly, or micro um, cephaly, or severe micro cephaly, or listen cephaly. And the key mechanisms um, that might lead to it. First of all, it's accumulation of the ectopic neurons, basically what we see on the MRI as an extra layer of the um, brain matter underlying the cortex. Um, it is um, defects in the methodic ma uh, machinery and very important point that comes more and more aligned and we will uh, talk about this uh, ra uh, the role of the radial glial cells just in the next slides. Uh, one of the possible mechanisms um, for full group of listen cephaly is the detachment of the radial glial cells and its ectopic proliferation. Um, that leads to the premature neural differentiation, defects in spindle uh, formation, and also, especially in the case of uh, CVA microcephaly, uh, the apoptosis of the neural progenitors is an important um, pathological mechanism. So, even from this first slide, um, you might uh, get the idea that lysencephaly actually starts way before the um, neuronal, um, the migrational wave of the newborn neurons is coming. So, it's is a complex disorder, complex malformation of cortical development, is not just an abnormal a result of abnormal cortical mo um, uh, cellular movements. Um, what else supporting, of course, the migrational um, ideology is um, their genes that are um, when mutated they lead to lysencephaly. We know 31 um, lysencephaly associated genes. So far, and 25 of them um, are representing uh, or encoding for, stru uh, for structural or regulatory cytoskeletal proteins. Um, but there is a small group here underneath, six genes so far, that cannot be linked directly to the cytoskeleton. We have here transcription factors, we have apoptosis, and we have a cell cycle uh, responsible genes. I would like to stop on um, briefly on apoptosis. Um, so what we see here clinically um, in the case of CRAD or PDD1 associated lysencephaly, we see so-called mild lysencephaly or this lysencephaly with their cortical thickness 5 to 10 millimeters. Um, basically identical picture with the predominantly frontal involvement in the um, case of CRAD or PDD1. Uh, both of them are caused, both, both of these variants caused by biallelic um, um, variants, so it's a recessive form. And um, the limited evidence that we have about possible cortical structure in these patients, um, suggesting that we actually do not observe an abnormal cortical lane here. We have um, mouse data on uh, crack not out representing absolutely normal, indistinguishable. Um, uh, wild type um, uh, cortical uh, cortical layers, and we have one report with the post mortem uh, mortem examination of the fetus, the homozygous for the um, pathogenic crack variants, um, and the neuropathologists were describing simply by gyral pattern um, with cerebral cortex, a small fossil of clean hypocellular cortex, um, whatever this might mean. Uh, but in any case, um, my idea would be if the neuropathologist would have seen an abnormal cortical layering, that would have been mentioned in the paper, even without the images. Um, briefly, what CRAD and PIDD um, gene or CRAD and PIDD proteins are encoding form, uh, these both genes work together to activate a procaspase 2. Procaspase 2 or caspase 2, it's an apoptotic gene. Um, that is um, responding on the genotoxic, uh, genotoxic stress in several cells, including neuronal cells, in active um, during embryonic development and also keeps activity um, during postnatal life and um, has a role in aging of the brain. Um, it um, caspates um, to activity may alter dendritic spimorphology. And the lack of caspase 2 um, uh, was uh, described with reduced um, dendritic um, pruning, resulting in cognitive inflexibility 
and um, abnormal behavior in their knockout mice. Um, what happens if, um, in case of um, disease-causing variants in CRAD and PADD, both of these variants um, would be located in the so-called death domain, the place where both genes are supposed to interact and form the so-called pedosome to activate the caspase. And for both genes, there are functional data um, proving that mutants cannot um, form an active pedosome and all at least studied uh, mutants fail to activate caspase too. Um, so that might lead to the decreased cell death, or to, um, that is a reason for the increased cortical thickness, but also we shouldn't for, um, forget the possible mechanism of the abnormal dendritic pruning that is a normal process during um, early postnatal um, development in the few, um, during first months that is probably impaired in the affected patients. Um, so, uh, I gave you at least one example where lysencephaly is not caused by abnormal cellular movement, but um, of course there are also multiple um, examples where lysencephalated mutations do affect cellular migration. Here you see two um, examples of um, abno um, um, abnormal fibroblast behavior in the um, mouse um, um, knockout for this one and in um, patient-derived fibroblasts with the variants, pathogenic variants in ACTB gene. Um, we, in both cases, we um, observe severely reduced velocity in case of their um, ACTB variants, also um, 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 clearly abnormal um, displacement. Uh, however, um, the recent data that could be um, obtained on the uh, patient-derived models um, using cerebral organoids um, also um, shows um, the complex mechanism and not just abnormal um, neuronal migration. So we have here uh, graphical abstracts from two papers that um, were published back-to-back -back in 2017. Um, both groups um, use the same approach, um, starting from their fibroblast of patients with the Miller-Dicker syndrome, and they use different protocols uh, to um, produce um, cerebral organoids. Um, despite of the different protocols, they have just identical results, demonstrating the prominent role of the outer radial glial cells. So what happens in uh, these Miller-Dicker organoids um, first of all, um, um, these organoids have, uh, have reduced size and um, reduced cell number, uh, and they also demonstrate abnormal cell division. Um, what, uh, what the authors mean by abnormal cell division? Um, they observe a switch from vertical to horizontal division planes uh, of the ventricular radial glial cells. Which consequences this would have? Um, that would have um, this uh, daughter cell that is appears um, after the horizontal cleavage has a different fate. This daughter cell will not stay at the ventricular cortex in the neuronal progenitor pool, but is sent out to be uh, to become a neuron. That is why, um, at least as it was suggested, this is the reason of the premature neurogenesis observed in the melodicar organoids. An additional characteristic is also their alteration of the epical membrane seen in, in melodica organoids. Here we see um, n staining staining um, used for their um, under injunction, basically to demonstrate a cell-cell contact and how tight a cells can uh, hold together. And we see uh, that this line is severely scattered in melodica. We see the same um, picture of the abnormal ventricular surface, um, also in a different um, organoid, um, after the different organoid differentiation protocol. Exactly the same pattern we observed in patients with different lysis of limitation, not in this one, but in both actin genes. Um, we, here we see the same standing, uh, staining uh, using n or also another staining for the tight junctions. 
uh, we see this cuttered and um, interrupted cell line that is also the feature that becomes even more prominent the more organoids get mature. Also in actin um, um, mutated organoids we see re decreased cell number, um, decreased number of the neural progenitors and inverted production of the deep and upper lane neurons. Of course, it is still work in progress, and it's um, um, it's a preliminary data. But uh, what we probably see here that independently from the uh, causative gene, lysencephaly might have some profound um, and common profound mechanisms. That meaning that thinking about the therapy, uh, we might not need to develop a, a treatment for every single gene but uh, probably our work might be easier if we can um, um, identify and address the common developmental mechanisms. And almost my last slide, um, demonstrating where we are with the therapy of lysencephaly uh, patients right now, well, we are not doing good work. Um, so one of the main challenges uh, treating this patient is to control their and um, this is the slide that I'm probably showing already during the third meeting, and this remains um, still the only available systematic assessment of their uh, clinical features and um, response of anti-epileptic drugs in this encephaly patient, representing a small cohort of patients with uh, this one variants. And but even this um, small cohort already gives the first clues. Um, very um, um, important for the treatment of planning the um, anti-epileptic treatment, um, already demonstrating the certain anti-epileptic that are, wouldn't be the first choice uh, in treating genital epilepsy, is more, they're way more effective than, some, uh, uh, for example, uh, the levetiracetam that is most of the time is a first um, a medicine of choice um, by um, treating the childhood or early childhood seizures. That is probably not the best choice uh, for lysencephaly patients at all. So my summary, um, that in lysencephaly we are dealing with genetic disorder. Uh, we have um, more than 30 genes uh, associated with lysencephaly and we can diagnose um, more than 80% of the patients. The pathogenesis is complex and goes way beyond the neuronal migration. And uh, we do need to consolidate our efforts to provide a proper documentation of the clinical course of natural history. And also we need to start working on the new therapeutic approaches, helping these patients. And at this moment, I would like to um, thank my colleagues and also all the uh, funding agencies and you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer your questions. This is the overview of my uh, talk today. I will start with some general information on, uh, on heterotopia and then we'll focus primarily on the periventricular nodular heterotopia, uh, its etiology and uh, diagnostic consensus workflow for heterotopia, which uh, Natalia also introduced a bit for the lysencephalies. And um, the second part of my presentation, I will talk about some rare uh, observations which um, we saw in the clinic and some uh, we found in the literature. Um, well, heterotopia are um, uh, caused by a failure of neuronal uh, migration. And uh, as Natalia already pointed out, uh, this might not be an intrinsic migrational defect of uh, the precursors, but uh, could also be due to, to other factors, uh, in, including cell divisions and uh, support of radial glial cells and, uh, and the ependym. Um, here in the picture, you can see uh, the classical uh, MRI scan of the bilateral uh, periventricular nodular heterotopia depicted by the, by the red arrows. 
um, but um, uh, there are some other uh, subtypes in the middle. You can see the subcortical band heterotopia, uh, which are part of the lysencephaly spectrum, as Natalia just uh, showed you. Uh, another rare form is the, on the right, the curvy linear subcortical heterotopia, which are usually very asymmetric. And um, uh, the great majority of the heterotopia is located uh, where you would expect uh, the white matter. Usually these heterotopia extend to the ventricle and also connect to the overlying uh, cortex. Um, so we cannot talk about uh, periventricular nodular heterotopia without mentioning filament A. So I just will start with this because this is a, a diagnosis that uh, that shouldn't be missed in a patient with, uh, with heterotopia. Um, these uh, can be caused by uh, both missense and truncate invariants uh, in the filament A gene and also intergenic deletions duplications have been uh, described. Um, we find um, most mutations in filament A in females uh, with a positive family history. Usually the scan shows multiple heterotopia, uh, frontal predominant and uh, bilateral. What is also a clue on the brain scan is um, uh, abnormalities in the fossa posterior, uh, including cerebellar hypoplasia, uh, retrocellular cysts and uh, megacisterna magna. And also the corpus callosum can be uh, uh, have an abnormal morphology or be hypoplastic. Um, so if we have a typical pattern, uh, the yield um, uh, of filament A testing is quite high and even reported in literature up to uh, 80 to 100 um, percent. But it is, it is much lower in the sporadic heterotopia cases. Uh, literature states uh, numbers between 9 and 26 uh, percent in these and I think that's what we also find in, in clinical practice. Um, of course filament A uh, does not just cause uh, central nervous system abnormalities including seizures um, but it's a systemic disorder and it can affect many other organs including um, the cardiovascular um, system with congenital heart disease, for example, atrial septal defects and um, uh, valvular dysplasias. Uh, what is very important, it can cause aortic aneurysms, which can rupture. Um, also, gastrointestinal complaints are very common, uh, especially constipation. And a number of patients present with respiratory abnormalities, which can occur from birth or later in life. Uh, connective, tif connective tissue abnormalities, hypermobility can occur, and also a bleeding disorder caused by platelet abnormalities. Um, however, uh, we know many other causes for uh, PVNH. It has a broad clinical spectrum. Here you can see um, three uh, different um, families and patients with a different etiology of their uh, PVNH. The first is a girl with an RFCAF2 mutation with intellectual disability, microcephaly, movement disorder, and cardiomyopathy. Um, the filament A I've just uh, discussed, and um, uh, well, we have reported one family with three siblings with mutations in the INTS8 uh, gene, which is part of the integrator complex, and uh, they all had severe intellectual disability, epilepsy, spasticity, and uh, cerebral visual impairment. Um, so this can aid a little bit the clinical presentation in searching for the etiology. The etiology is very broad and can be categorized in, in chromosomal causes, monogenic causes, disruptive causes, and unfortunately there's a large group where uh, the cause remains unknown. Um, so, and I think we all keep uh, keep lists like this to to um, uh, uh, list all the possible causes um, of this of this PVNH. Uh, here I divided this into chromosomal, uh, copy number variants, and monogenic causes. But of course, this list is not uh, not complete. And um, a student of mine performed a systematic literature search to find um, uh, uh, all uh, reported causes in the in or associations in the literature. 
and uh, we divided um, uh, her findings in into two major categories. Um, ones where two or more cases have been described with uh, the same etiology, and those where only one uh, case have been ha has been described. Um, where we think that, well, if there's two or more cases, it's a more likely true association. And if it's only one case, the chances of being coincidental are, are greater. Um, as you can see, we found uh, both uh, copy number variants and genes involved. And if you add these all up, uh, it comes to 96 genes and loci that have been reported in the literature associated with PVNH. Um, if you look at other types of heterotopia, um, in the upper panel you can see uh, the results for subcortical band heterotopia. It was um, uh, much less. We didn't find any chromosomal events and um, nine uh, monogenic uh, uh, causes in two or more cases and six where only one case has been described. And for other subcortical heterotopia, we found uh, 13 genes um, and uh, with more than uh, one case and with only one case, 16 genes. So uh, it's doubtful what, uh, uh, what those uh, associations means and if uh, we'll have to wait uh, for more patients to be published to see if these are true associations or not. <laughs> Um, in, in, um, um, because um, there's, well, the true prevalence of heterotopia is not known, but uh, there was one study from, from Rotterdam, the Generation R study, where they have scanned almost uh, 4,000 children um, and found uh, subendepinal heterotopia, so PVNH, in 19 of those children, which is about half percent of children, which is a quite high uh, prevalence, if this is true, but this is also reinforcing the thought that maybe uh, a lot of associations we find in literature are not uh, true uh, associations, are uh, incidental. Um, here are some of the um, chromosomal aberrations that are found more than twice and often and uh, are reported in literature and also seen uh, uh, in the clinic. Um, here in Utrecht. Um, so the smith magenna syndrome, uh, several cases uh, are known to show heterotopia and there's not a clear pattern in, in the scanning. The, the heterotopia are usually um, um, scattered and there are not so many. They can be unilateral or bilateral or just even a single nodule. Um, the brachycephaly is, is what you can see, of course, with your dysmorphic uh, examination, but also on the scan. Um, the deletion of chromosome 1p36 um, is, of course, uh, associated with a distinct clinical syndrome, and, um, and it's known to uh, be associated with polymicrogyria, but also in a number of patients, uh, PVNH is found and uh, can be quite subtle. Um, you can see here in the left with very small nodules, uh, they can be a bit larger, but usually it's not very extensive. Um, the Jacobson syndrome, or caused by deletion of 11Q, uh, can cause quite extensive um, PVNH bilaterally. And um, uh, the deletion of uh, 6Q27 uh, has been reported several times and uh, causes a distinct malformations with usually um, posterior ventriculomegaly. Uh, abnormalities of the corpus callosum, the cerebellum, and uh, usually a few, uh, or not usually, but in a number of patients, a few heterotopia can be seen, either unilateral or bilateral. Um, in a recent study by several members of the consortium, we um, can see that um, uh, many different CNVs are associated with PVNH. And um, as, uh, the, uh, as stated in the title, this indicates extreme genetic heterogeneity, which I fully agree with. And in only 42 patients with PVNH, they found 15 uh, CNVs. 
um, about one third. And uh, among these, seven novel loci, so seven loci that were not reported previously in the literature. So it will be very difficult to, to recognize uh, from, from the clinical examination these distinct syndromes. Um, this is also one of the goals of the um, uh, international consensus recommendations, which we published last year, um, is to um, um, uh, uh, make these available for, for any clinician uh, encountering a patient with MCD, uh, including PVNH is that the etiology is so uh, heterogeneous um, and uh, you cannot expect um, to recognize each syndrome just from the clinical examination. And that's why we decided to, um, uh, to make this flowchart, which Natalia has, has already showed to you. This is um, a, a summary taken from that flowchart. Um, which starts with a patient who is diagnosed with MCD either uh, on imaging or, or pathology after um, epilepsy surgery. And uh, of course it starts with a clinical workup. Um, and uh, of course you try to establish a clinical diagnosis. Uh, this is not possible or if the differential diagnosis is still very broad after your clinical workup, we um, recommend to just start looking for copy number variants and uh, secondly uh, do an MCD gene panel for which we provided also a gene list. Um, of course as Natalia already mentioned um, it's also possible um, uh, to do copy number uh, analysis on, uh, on the NGS data in some cases and then in this case you can of course skip the microarray analysis. Um, if this does not result in a clear um, a pathogenic variant, um, you can opt for a trio open exome uh, analysis. Um, or uh, if you have a suspicion of a single gene disorder, of course, you can consider targeted testing. Um, well, we know all, uh, all from practice that phenotype um, is not always explained by your trio exome. And uh, if it remains unexplained, consider, of course, the clinical reevaluation. Uh, expert imaging review can be helpful. And of course, uh, the Neuromic organizes also MRI review sessions, which you can join. Uh, consider karyotyping to look for uh, balanced translocations, but which can truncate a certain gene. Um, of course, you can do homozygosity mapping, uh, targeted deep sequencing uh, for certain indications, especially the megalencephaly syndromes, which can sometimes be associated with PVNH as well. Um, try uh, different tissues if you suspect a mosaicism. Um, metabolic testing is not so relevant uh, for PVNH uh, if that's your only finding. But of, of course, if you suspect an, uh, an, uh, a broader syndrome, this can be done. Um, uh, consider a second MRI scan, consider any neurological investigations, especially in the hypotonic child. Enroll in research studies if possible and, and always reevaluate your patients because um, uh, we, there are so many new genes discovered um, every year. Um, also very important to um, um, encor encourage your families to, to seek peer support and one of the possibilities is to uh, refer them to the PVNH support and awareness, which is led by Yolaine Dupont, a member um, of, uh, of the Neuromic, of course. And she provided me with this slide to, to have some more information about what they do exactly. So the PVNH support and awareness, uh, awareness provides support to already over 650 families in 30, uh, four different countries, and uh, especially in uh, in the Americas and UK Europe. Um, it fundraises for research. It's a, a partner of several organizations studying rare diseases, including, of course, Neuromig. It also has a registry. And from this um, uh, registry, um, Jolene uh, collected the following data um, that um, before uh, the diagnosis was established, 46% um, of patients pre uh, presented with seizures 
Um, and there was a number presenting with cognitive delay, lung disease, motor delay, and migraines, both at 5%. And they still have ongoing symptoms, mainly seizures and cognitive and motor delays. Also, hypermobility and headaches in 40% of the patients. Uh, then the diagnostic journey, um, for uh, 20%, it took one to five years to establish the, the diagnosis. And 22%, uh, it took even longer, five to 20 uh, years. You can see the all, uh, a large number also um, uh, visited more, four or more specialists. Um, and what is also uh, striking is that uh, 30 percent uh, did not uh, receive genetic counseling. And I know a number of these patients uh, did not undergo uh, genetic testing either. Um, the PVNH Support and Awareness also um, organizes the PVNH Awareness Day and the PVNH Month, which is um, in March. Uh, and health international conferences for both patients and, and experts uh, to meet and share uh, data. Unfortunately, the last meeting was planned for last year, but uh, was cancelled due to the corona crisis. Um, it's also partnering in research, for example, uh, studying uh, the cardiovascular uh, problems and the, and the epilepsy. Um, so what are we missing in uh, in the undiagnosed patients? Well, of course, there can still be uh, genes out there um, which have not been identified in association with PV and age. Uh, mosaicism can uh, can play a role, which has been described, for example, in filament A patients. Um, and maybe um, uh, fetal brain injury plays also a major role. And this is, of course, always difficult to... Uh, to prove as a as a causative mechanism, um, uh, in uh, 2019, um, Bill Dobbins and Kimberly Aldinger um, published a paper on uh, cerebellar uh, malformations, cerebellar hyperplasia, and Dandy Walker malformations, and they um, identified a group of patients with cerebellar abnormalities and also um, posterior PVNH and found evidence in this group also for fetal brain injury. For example, here you see a patient with a cerebellar cleft in the right uh, image, which is very suspect for fetal brain injury, and in addition had a posterior heterotopia. Um, also, heterotopia have been described in uh, several patients uh, with COL4A1 and COL4A2 uh, mutations, uh, usually in combination with either porencephaly or, or cortical malformations, schizencephaly. So this is an example of fetal brain injury uh, with a genetic uh, ba background. Um, here are some papers on, um, on mosaicism in the heterotopia. Of course, these um, um, upper two were found in, in blood, the mosaicism, but uh, we don't know how, how much we're missing when testing the blood. Um, also, something we're missing with genetic testing is ICARD syndrome because the cause is still unknown. Um, it presents in, in girls with a classical trial of colossal genesis, infantile spasms, and the choreal retinal lacuna, although um, uh, many girls do not uh, exhibit the complete triad. Um, however, the brain imaging is, is very distinct. Um, uh, it shows an abnormal corpus callosum in about in 100% of the girls. Usually there are um, cysts, cortical abnormalities, nodular heterotopia, and uh, often there's also um, a posterior fossa abnormalities and abnormalities of the basal ganglia. So this can be recognized on brain imaging. Here's some more examples of the abnormalities. You can see also um, uh, striking is the asymmetry of the malformations, the cysts, and uh, also cerebellar heterotopia, which can be observed. Um, now we'll talk about um, some observations. I'm not sure if they're true uh, associations, and I would really uh, be interested to hear about similar cases from you, if possible. Um, this is uh, a boy who presented with an astrocytoma and on brain scan also had an arachnoid kist 
and some small and scattered PVNH. You can see here in, in the temporal horns and more frontally. Um, uh, the cause is unknown. However, he was found to have a deletion on chromosome 8 containing only two genes, which includes uh, the DCL1 gene, which is a tumor suppressor gene. Um, well, it doesn't explain uh, the heterotopia. Um, a second case that presented with a brain tumor um, is uh, seen here. This girl presented with a neuroepithelial tumor and uh, bilateral, quite large uh, heterotopia. Uh, can see it here. Um, and a third case uh, presented with a very rare tumor, a diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor, and uh, had a single quite large uh, heterotopia. So, uh, in literature, I, uh, I found this case report. Also, um, uh, some of the neuromic members are, are co-authors here. And this is a child with a pilocytic astrocytoma and uh, also had some very small periventricular nodular heterotopia. He was found to have a deletion, the classical deletion at 22Q11 and a duplication on chromosome 15. Um, but not sure if this has anything to do with um, the abnormalities on, uh, on the brain scan. And um, well, this is the only report I could, uh, I could identify about the combination of heterotopia and, uh, and brain tumors. Um, uh, I've also encountered a, cage, a case with focal cortical dysplasia. Um, uh, with a quite extensive occipital um, uh, heterotopia bilaterally. And um, this um, adult male also presented with ADD and dyslexia and had three uh, occurrences of a pneumothoracis. Interestingly, but probably it's not significant, um, he was found to have a compound heterozygous variants in the MCPH1 gene, uh, which is associated with primary uh, microcephaly. Um, there was one nonsense mutation and a um, variant of unknown significance. Um, a second case with a combination of heterotopia and focal cortical dysplasia was found to have a DEPDC5 mutation. And um, in the literature, um, this does not seem to be a very um, uh, frequent um, combination. I found two uh, reports. The one um, by Ingrid Schaeffer and colleagues, one of the first reports on the DEPTC5 mutations where they describe a patient who has more like a subcortical small band uh, here within the white matter and one mentioning in the Baldassari paper about a patient with a focal subcortical heterotopia where uh, I couldn't find um, uh, a published image for this to compare. Uh, also, what I found a very interesting observation um, um, is um, the combination of subcortical band heterotopia. Um, here in this patient, uh, located mostly parietal occipitally, and it's quite a thin uh, band, as you can appreciate here, and uh, located frontally, two nodular heterotopia, which are not quite periventricular, they're more located within the white matter. And the second uh, patient, also a girl like the first one, um, has these nodular heterotopia in the exact same location bilaterally and also uh, a subcortical band. So very, very similar imaging. Um, the exome in the first uh, girl came back negative with just some variants of unknown significance. We're still waiting genetic testing in the, in the second one. But if you recognize this uh, this pattern, please let me know. Um, some other rare heterotopia I would just like to mention is uh, the laminar heterotopia, which um, uh, are observed in the Van Meldegram syndrome, which are quite distinct for, from the periventricular nodular heterotopia in appearance. Um, uh, usually this diagnosis is not missed because of the distinct clinical syndrome um, and uh, Sylvia Capello also talked about a bit more about the mechanism in, in this type of heterotopia yesterday. Um, 
Also a very distinct and rare pattern is the ribbon-like heterotopia, um, which have now been described in only six or seven families in the world. But it's a very recognizable syndrome. Um, you can here appreciate the ribbon form, uh, the undulating form of the heterotopia located within the white matter. Uh, these patients also have uh, megalencephaly, uh, usually hydrocephalus, but not all. And the overlying cortex is very abnormal. Uh, it's polymicrogyria-like with a very uh, small uh, gyri. Um, there is an agenesis of the corpus callosum and small and fused thalami. Um, another interesting uh, pattern is uh, found in patients with TAP B mutations. And of course, the tubulinopathies uh, have very recognizable features on brain Im uh, imaging. Um, but uh, the patient with TAP B mutations usually have. Um, uh, not a very abnormal cortex. You can see some abnormalities, but um, it's not the main feature. Usually they have a, quite a small head circumference. And um, uh, this heterotopia, which we named peritrigonal optic pathway heterotopia, which are usually bilaterally seen here within the white matter. And uh, if you also look back to the publication of the first patients with tab B mutations, one of the patients also showed this peculiar location of the heterotopia. And we observe a similar pattern in some patients with CAT and B1 mutations, um, which you can see here depicted by the white arrows. Very distinct uh, location and usually bilateral. And that's interesting because uh, CAT and B1 is part of the catenin complex, which is involved in the severing of the of the tubulins in um, in the mitotic spindle and also the cytoskeleton. So there is probably an interaction between the, the two. Uh, well, I've come to the end of my of my presentation, and I uh, want to summarize that for heterotopia, there's a very wide spectrum of presentation and an extremely diverse etiology. Uh, what, and this is part of the reason why we um, recommended broad genetic testing in, uh, in the flow chart, in the consensus recommendations. And, um, well, um, Jolene sent me a big thank you slide uh, on behalf of the PVNH community. Um, thank you for your interest and um, your participation in, in research studies. And I would really like to thank all the members of the Neuromic Consortium for the past four years. Thank you. Thank you, the organizing committee, for the invitation. And we are speaking a little bit about uh, the cost, uh, uh, our work on midbrain and hindbrain malformations, and a, a little proposal. Uh, in the end for the continuity of this great job of the cost action on malformations of cortical development. And uh, in the prenatal field, we see a very, very big diagnostic challenge regarding the diagnosis of midbrain and hindbrain abnormalities, especially because the brainstem anatomy and many of the developmental homeworks are less defined. There's a need for advanced neurosonographic and also fetal MRI technique in order to make the correct and accurate diagnosis of these entities. The obstetricians are not aware of the entities that affect the brainstem and many of the entities that affect the cerebellum. So whenever we hear many uh, uh, lectures on uh, cerebellar abnormalities, we listen on uh, dandy vocal malformations, megacisterna magna, and the uh, Blake's pouch cysts, but all the field of the vermian hypoplasias really, really become very gray. There's a large imaging overlapping, especially in early gestational ages. And there are many entities that have late appearance and it also poses a challenge because many fetuses would not be screened after 20 to 24 weeks. And also the advances of genetics and the implication of genetics in those cases, as many of them have a high rate of recurrence. 
And speaking about uh, our work from 2016 also gives me an opportunity to thank the people uh, who have uh, taught me and uh, leaded me throughout this uh, journey. All our work with Midrain and Hadmer Malformations and this project has started with uh, Professor Talisagi. Professor Talisagi uh, is a mentor and a great friend and she brought from uh, Australia six cases and I got this uh, really, really pleasure to have it from her as a present. So she put it in my hand. And then from then we started uh, together with the team from Volso Medical Center to work on these uh, uh, abnormalities and to turn these six cases into what I'm going to show in the next uh, slides. But I'm sure that uh, this interest of our group for, for uh, the brainstem abnormalities and the brainstem structures started way before. And in 2013, uh, we published together with a, my great uh, mentor and friend and uh, the one and only Professor uh, Gustavo Malinge, who is really uh, teaching me for the last 10 years. And we had this first publication on the vermis pons and the brainstem. And uh, in 2014, uh, in the end of 2013, Professor Leibovic uh, joined the group and we had two very interesting uh, publications on the normal and abnormal aspects of the midbrain and the hindbrain. And then uh, Professor Malinger uh, kept his work in Tel Aviv Medical Center, Professor Leibovic at Wolfson Medical Center. And we, we have uh, worked uh, together uh, since then. Uh, maybe my interest on these uh, abnormalities and the development of midbrain and hindbrain structures has started way before when I got the opportunity to hug the cerebellum and the brainstem structures and then I think maybe the bonding started there. But the jokes apart, and we work in a very uh, a wide uh, setting, I will uh, although I am in, not in the very, very good way to show to you, but it's important for me that you see the team from Volson and the very big team from uh, Tel Aviv Medical Center. So we work in a very, very large team of people uh, together with the interdisciplinary uh, crew, the Professor Eliat Ben Sira from the MRI, so she is the head of the pediatric radiology and without her input, it wouldn't be uh, possible to work. Phytopathology, pediatric neurology and neurosurgery at uh, Tel Aviv Medical Center, the genetics, the students, and all the international collaborators. And I'll have the opportunity to show some of the cases that we got from many different countries. And then from the, the, the six initial cases, and now we have more than 300 cases and we have established the International Consortium of Prenatal Diagnosis um, of Midbrain and Hindbrain Anomalies. We have collaborators from 12 different countries, expert consultants. The first one was Professor Andrea Poretti from the United States who have really, really helped us in the beginning of the project and then very uh, unfortunately passed away and left her left us with many questions. And then in the continuity, Professor Gregor Kasprian and at last but not least, uh, Dr. Savina Severino from Italy. So Savi, if you are listening and uh, really, really uh, contributed to us in this uh, project. And then this is our actual uh, numbers. So we have 323 cases of abnormalities, and we did not include dandy Walker malformations, mega cisterna magna, or Blake's pouch cyst, uh, but we indeed included many different uh, groups of uh, malformations that affect uh, midbrain and hindbrain uh, structures, and uh, very proud to present uh, them uh, to you. So this is a, a mini and a very homemade a project when compared to cost, but it really worked and it shows the importance of the uh, international uh, collaboration. And we had a very nice uh, academic output, which is still on the go. 
several presentations in international congresses and awards, papers that we have published uh, regarding the normal development, abnormal development, and description of very rare uh, abnormalities. And another very important thing that was developed from this project was a protocol for fetal assessment of the midbrain and the hindbrain structures. We need to understand that the gynecologist will be mostly, and in most countries, the practitioner that will do the anatomy scan of the fetuses. In some countries, there is also the, the radiologist will do the obstetric ultrasound. But if we keep asking the, the patient only when was her last menstruation period date, it wouldn't help us for the diagnosis of many of the brain abnormalities. And so we need to make a switch in our minds and start asking the right questions and thinking about uh, how the neurologists and, and the people from genetics uh, uh, think. And I think this is one of the main things that we have learned from uh, this uh, group uh, in COST and from the multidisciplinary action that we have. Another step is to understand the different stages of brain development and uh, how the same malformation presents in different gestational ages, because it poses really a challenge. And of course, we won't see the real cobblestone abnormality by 15 weeks, uh, but we'll see indeed the Z-shaped brainstem by 15 weeks. So this is also an, an important thing that we learned on the way and we could establish very nice references and Gustavo will speak about the early diagnosis uh, to you in a while. Another part of the protocol is to establish what we have to check and what are the, the imaging uh, planes that we need to check for. And we added the fourth ventricle uh, plane to this cerebellar assessment, a part of the classic transcerebellar plane, and the importance to assess the morphology of the cerebellum and the midbrain and the brainstem structures in the axial plane, and how it differs throughout the whole pregnancy, and the aspect of the fourth ventricle that shall be kept throughout the whole pregnancy, larger lateral laterally, that longer anteroposteriorly, and the cerebellar aspect as well, and this also was published, and it's very important to raise suspicion on vermian uh, dysgenesis whenever we have no communications between the fourth ventricle and cisterna magna. Unfortunately, this slide uh, hides the, the different planes, but here we have the as axial assessment of the brainstem structures, which was never assessed before prenatally, or at least it was never published. And then we have a very nice correlation between pathology and sonographic imaging of midbrain, uh, pons, and medulla, and this is feasible and helps us in order to make differenti differential diagnosis between entities. The aqueductal aspect and the midbrain uh, views throughout the whole uh, pregnancy uh, really help us to make the diagnosis of midbrain anomalies and aqueductal stenosis. How do we scan the brain? So not only we need a mid-sagittal view, but we need to know how to insulate this brain in order to get the different information that we need. If we, checking on, we are checking on the diencephalon and the mesencephalon cleavage, so we need to have a specific insulation, and this is also part of our protocol, and also the, the use of unusual uh, sonographic windows like the innominate suture in order to address the fetal brainstem as well. Here I, I can uh, demonstrate to you the differences in the brainstem shape throughout the first half of pregnancy. I won't enter it this much because Gustavo is addressing it, but this difference again are very, very important to be known in order not to misdiagnose or to overdiagnose diseases in early pregnancy. The uh, more complex assessment of the cerebellar structure, much more than the measurement of the cerebellar diameter, is very important. It's symmetry and uh, the development of the folia throughout gestation and the coronal views of the cerebellum 
are also very, very important in the differential diagnosis. These are the views, the only, maybe the only views that will help us to make the diagnosis of cerebellar cortical dysplasias with abnormal development of the folia and irregularities of the folia. A link with the COSMI uh, study group is the analysis of the supratentorium. Once many of the brainstem abnormalities have uh, malformations of cortical development associated. Two years ago, I had the opportunity to participate to the COST uh, uh, Congress in Rehovot and to show a <laughs> little bit of our analysis <laughs> regarding <laughs> and the malformations of cortical <laughs> development. And uh, very, very important within the supratentorium, not only the migration, but also the assessment of the diencephalon. We have spoken a little bit about the cleavage, but also the uh, morphology of the uh, basal ganglia, the presence of the anterior limb of the internal capsule, the uh, ganglionic eminence. Uh, so also in axial and coronal views, they are very important. This is a very nice paper from Dr. Rui Birnbaum describing the anatomy and the development of the third ventricle and its behavior in the different types of uh, obstructive, obstructive ventriculomegaly. And of course, for the differential diagnosis, the analysis of the extracerebral findings are very important. We also developed for us a protocol of analysis of uh, MRI studies, also in axial views, but in mid-sagittal views as well, uh, based on the work of Dan Doherty and understanding the differences in the proportional of the development of the brainstem structure. And this is a very nice contribution from uh, Gregor Kasprin from Austria, demonstrated the evolution of the development of the brain structures throughout pregnancy. Another nice contribution are these slides from Patricia Scheinfeld from Brazil, also one of our great contributions with many cases, demonstrating the abnormal aspects of the midbrain in mid-sagittal views, and the pons in axial views and helping us to establish abnormal and abnormal patterns in order to make differential diagnosis from entities. So I will show to you some cases uh, that we have collected throughout uh, the time. And uh, here again, I'm so sorry that the slides do not work, but we have solution for almost everything in life. So we will also make it make a solution for that. So here we have many cases of brainstem kinking and the walking warburg syndrome and the alpha distoglycanopathies, I think they are the main representants of the brainstem kinking uh, feature with very severe brainstem hypoplasia. But as I show you here with many other examples, they are not the only ones. So after 15 weeks, we shall see straightening and disappearance of the flexures. And whenever it does not happen, so we have a wide range of differential diagnosis, which uh, important aspects between them. And one of the, the most uh, important uh, feature regarding prenatal diagnosis is that most of these entities will cause with a ventriculomegaly. So many times before the brainstem abnormality is diagnosed, the fetus will come to us with dilation of the ventri lateral ventricles. And these will be the start of the our uh, saga in order to search. Uh, another group that wasn't represented in the last slide is an L1 syndrome. This is a case from Savina and uh, Professor Andrea Rossi uh, in Italia. So very uh, mild brainstem kinking with the callosal abnormality and the very characteristic bulky mass intermedia representing the L1 syndrome features. And here we see the adducted thumbs in a male fetus at uh, 28 weeks. Here are two cases from uh, Professor Leibovich illustrating the very severe brainstem hypoplasia and the brainstem kinking in walker warburg syndrome. Again, corpus callosum is affected and these fetuses uh, differently from other causes of brainstem kinking 
maybe many times diagnosed very early in pregnancy. I will leave it to Professor Malinger again, but here you see 18 weeks and features. We don't see the cobblestone, but we see many other features that will lead to the diagnosis. This is another very uh, quite new field of a study about the encephalic mesencephalic junction dysplasias. And uh, uh, Savina has described the two different types, A and B. Uh, the, one, the first may be diagnosed mainly in axial views with the butterfly sign. The type B will be diagnosed mainly in mid-sagittal views with the fusion between the massa intermedia and the superior aspect of the midbrain. And these are two cases from Brazil. Tubulinopathies is again another very, uh, at least for the prenatal field, a uh, very new uh, field of uh, study. And here we compare the MR and the ultrasound features. So ultrasound really help us to suspect on the presence of tubulinopathy with the characteristic asymmetry of the frontal horn and the asymmetry here, we see the asymmetry of the olfactories and the abnormal vermis, abnormal corpus callosum as well. And this is a tub BB3 by 26 weeks. Another tubulinopathy, this is a case from Azerbaijan. Again, asymmetry of the brain, asymmetry of the frontal horns, abnormal basal ganglia, small cerebellum, Z-shaped brainstem. And this is a, a very nice case. Here, if you see, we see no lamination at all of the brain, have no cortical plate, and a very wide interhemispheric fissure. And this is the MR of this fetus by 30 weeks. Uh, again, abnormal corpus callosum, abnormal brainstem, hypoplastic. Here, more hypoplastic than the tub BB3 group, and the very abnormal uh, uh, sulcation and gyration. This is another case, a tub BB3 case, in which we see again the same features of the asymmetry of the frontal horns and the interdigitation between the interhemispheric fissure, the asymmetry in the brainstem uh, aspect. So, uh, even by ultrasound and with the complementary use of the MRI, we will are able to diagnose more and more these cases and then to send them to genetics with a more directed uh, diagnostic suspicion. This is a more severe case, TBA1A, by 24 weeks, no sylvian fissure, uh, interdigitation, agenesis of the corpus callosum, and very severely hypoplastic cerebellum. So this is a more severe case. Joubert syndrome is also a very interesting uh, uh, disease that we have studied uh, in uh, along the years. We have described the features of the fourth ventricle whenever the, there is no communication between the fourth ventricle and cisterna magna, also in axial, but also in a mid-sagittal views. And whenever I teach, uh, I also always uh, make the joke uh, that the normal cerebellum is like a seal. And then in Joubert syndrome, the long slanting cerebellar hemispheres are like a, a sea lion. And here I show uh, a slide or a, uh, something that Professor Leventer also says, that we can make a comparison to Roman cephalosynapsis with the fusion of the cerebellar hemispheres. And he said, this is like a donor duck. So it's quite a, a didactic joke, but it really helps in the differential diagnosis. And we have in press a very, uh, I am very proud of our work on 62 cases of Roman cephalosynapsis and the description of the neuro uh, um, imaging findings using either ultrasound and MRI for the description of these uh, two, these uh, 62 cases. This is a very nice group uh, contribution. So the features of the classic. And we have described uh, in deep for the first time the features for the diagnosis of partial rhombencephalosynapsis throughout pregnancy, and also the different brainstem findings and the supertentorial findings in these fetuses. This uh, paper is in press, and we really hope that soon also our second paper on the clinical association and the extracerebral findings will be published. Pontocerebellar hypoplasia is also a very important group that we have researched. 
Cask-related PCH is a, a, an interesting group in which many times the only prenatal feature is abnormal biometry. So cerebellum looks very nice morphologically, the rest of the brain as well, and the brainstem as well. But the biometrics is very abnormal. The cerebellum is below the second centile. And this is what's the only clue for the diagnosis of the cask-related pontocerebellar hypoplasia. In, uh, in utero, many times, the microcephaly is still not developed. And some cases are more severe, like this PTF1A. And it's one of, I think it's one of the only cases that we really see the dragonfly cerebellum um, uh, really, really clear in the prenatal period because the dragonfly is characteristically seen only after. And the last group of anomalies that I'll show to you are the tegmental cap dysplasias. We have one case from Australia severe cerebellar hypoplasia, mild ventriculomegaly, and then the MR study uh, depicted the cap uh, malformation in the tegmentum of the uh, pons. And here was the first description of a medullary tegmental cap dysplasia. Uh, here we see the bulging in the posterior aspect of the medulla. It was a very, very subtle finding and difficult to diagnose. And the MR here uh, shows us clearly uh, the bulging at the level of the medulla. And here is the PM confirming the case. So I think the diagnosis of midbrain and hindbrain anomalies really share features with the diagnosis of malformations in, of cortical development because the prevalence is unknown, as well as the prevalence of MCDs. And there was a very interesting uh, email uh, changing within the group regarding the prevalence of MCDs. And the same occurs with these diseases. Many of them are very, very rare. And that, that's why we need to work together. The sensitivity and the specificity of the prenatal imaging as well is unknown. And I don't know about the postnatal, but I think also it is unknown. We used, and our work was mainly based on the classification of Barkovich of 2009, but there are many points that are unsolved there and new diseases that were described since then. The diagnostic criteria was not very clear, especially during the prenatal uh, time, high rate of misdiagnosis uh, in pregnancy, and uh, the, the mechanisms of disease are quite uh, poorly uh, understood. And the most important thing, especially to the ones who work after, so the pediatricians, uh, are the wide range of postnatal outcomes. So uh, in the prenatal period, we have the challenge that we try to predict what will happen after and then counseling the patients and the, the families what to do with the pregnancy. And many times we have not enough information to make a good prediction. So whenever we work together with the neurologist and the genetics and the radiologist, then we are better. So what next? Uh, if we will be over with the cost action on malformations of cortical development, I should uh, modestly propose that maybe we can also continue a new group with a, a studying the midbrain and hindbrain abnormalities. This is a field in, in expansion. Uh, we have very high yield of genetic studies whenever the prenatal imaging is very, very dedicated. So we have an unpublished data uh, with a yield of a 57% uh, in midbrain and hindbrain malformations of the whole exome sequencing. 60 2% in malformations of cortical development and 75% in corpus callosum abnormalities whenever we do a very, very good selection of cases regarding ultrasound and MRI imaging. So this is very, very promising and I think this is the reason that we should keep working together. And the importance of prenatal diagnosis that we have discussed with the implication and the possibility of screening and PGD. So I leave you proposing a new group and I hope maybe it will interesting some of you guys. 
Uh, I spoke with uh, Savina uh, yesterday and she said also that she's very interested in keeping uh, our work together and I will be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much and again sorry for the, the problematic slides. My lecture is, is a little bit a continuation of the idea uh, we have with Karina and, and Tali Segui to, to continue the cost, uh, the cost with another, another uh, action. Uh, and, and my lecture will be, and again, in what next, uh, but formations involving the midbrain hindbrain, early recognition by transvaginal high resolution ultrasound. And I understand that many of, uh, of us are not in the field of imaging and surely not in the field of fetal imaging, but it's important for, for us to, to show you what we are able to do uh, in this field. Okay, uh, actually I'm presenting the, the two different studies, one after the other. Uh, and these are the, the teams that participated in the studies. Uh, the objective of the lecture is, uh, is to improve the diagnosis and management of malformations affecting the, mid, the midbrain hindbrain, and uh, I am going to show the, the fetal implications. The problems we have is uh, that uh, it's not exactly clear what are the early changes occurring in the midbrain hindbrain structures. Uh, second question, are the limits, uh, are there limits for good uh, quality ultrasound resolution? Uh, or the, I can ask the question another way as asking how early is early? And uh, the third question, the third problem is, is it will be possible to differentiate between normal and abnormal very early in pregnancy. This is an ultrasound image at eight weeks of pregnancy in a fetus that see the crown ramp length is between 15 and 22 millimeters. And I, and I, I am comparing, I am comparing this with the um, with the images uh, in the atlas of Bayer and Altman. And what you see here very clearly is the, the telencephalic supraventricle. You see the thalamus, and you see the romoencephalic choroid plexus. In the same in the same image, we are able to identify the pons, the pontin flexion, and the upper medulla. And at uh, this, this, this time, by this time, we see that the, the normal uh, midbrain has a Z shape, uh, it's Z shaped, has a kinking. So, if we perform ultrasound examinations later on and uh, we look at this early stage, we, need, we should be aware that the, the kinking is here, it's present at 12 weeks, it's still present at 13 weeks and a half. Okay, we know that by 18 weeks, as I show in this image, the kinken has disappeared. Uh, also, also, if I if I show this paper that was published in Radiographic in '93, you, showing in vitro MRIs, uh, you see that the kinking is present also in the uh, in the MRIs in, the, in these fetuses, and it starts uh, to to become right, uh, not kinked at around 15 to 16 weeks. Uh, this is a paper that we published uh, by Professor Lewich and our teams, where we show the measurements of a, lo a lot of uh, structures of the midbrain and the hindbrain uh, during the second trimester after 20 weeks. And you see that we are able to identify these structures very nicely at this time. I need an instant to stop because my computer is about to remain without uh, electricity. I need to connect it to the, to the room. Wait a minute, sorry. Don't worry, we will wait. <laughs> Not expected, but it's okay. It's, it's better to wait than, than to lose you totally. <laughs> no, it, it will take a few seconds, but it will be okay. Let me see what we have. Okay, now we are back back in the field okay so and, and and here you have again a representation of, of the, the the brain by ultrasound 11 weeks at crl of 14 to 50, 51 weeks and again 
Here you see that the, the Z shape is present, but with this time, 11 weeks, we are able to differentiate between the thalamus, the mesencephalum, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and to see also the cerebellum, the four ventricle, and the cisterna magna. Still kink. And here you have other examples. You have other examples of the kinking of the cerebellum. Now, where, where are our limits for good demonstration in uh, using regular uh, regular ultras on regular examinations? Uh, this is this is a picture that has been published recently in the in the White Journal, the Journal of Ultrasound and Obstetric and Gynecology, to 2021, showing what is a start of the art image of the uh, midbrain uh, during the first trimester, 11 to 13 weeks. And this is what, how we compare it when you perform the examination two or three weeks later at 15 weeks. And here you see very clear that the, the quality and the resolution of the image is much better. We are very, very, uh, very, it's very easy for us to see the, the aqueduct. We see the vermis and we see the, the black spout, the communication between the fourth ventricle, that at this time, the, the, the fastigum is still is present, is by this time present, and you see that it's completely normal. And these are the images of the of uh, cases of um, uh, what's called sonoembryology, the ultrasound again at the, at 11 to 14 weeks, and still the images when you you use a uh, transabdominal approach, uh, starting from axial planes, the the quality of the, res the resolution is 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 okay, but it's not uh, so so good. What we did in the first study, we studied. But we store 3D volumes of 60 normal fetuses between 14 and 19 weeks. And what you should be aware when you, what, what, what we did, what, what you, you need to be aware is that it's very important for to obtain the, the optimal image is where you come from, from the skull. If you come from the anterior fontanelle or, to, for the, or from the sagittal suture, this is what you are going to see. You are going to see a very nicely the, the corpus callosum may very, very early in pregnancy, but the posterior portion of the infratentorial structures are not clear seen. So what we do is we come from the posterior fontanelle to be able to see, to be able to see the images I showed you previously. Okay, and, and he, here you have the, the, the specimens, and what we do is we look for the transverse, transverse cerebellar diameter in a coronal plane, you need to, to see that at very, this very early stage, 15 weeks, you can see both hemispheres, and you see these white lines here that represent the vermis. We rotate the transducer 90 degrees, and at this moment you, you reach the correct plane, where we are able to see all the, all the structures. Again, a very prominent aqueduct, the tectum and the tegmentum. Here you have the pons, the brainstem, the, the cisterna magna and the fourth ventricle. We were able at this at, during this study to measure all the structures, uh, all the structures of the midbrain and the cerebellum, and to obtain normograms. Uh, it's important to be sure that you are exactly in, this, in the midplane because if not, you, you will be able to see something like that. That is the cerebellum, is the hemisphere, and not the vermis. And from all the measurements we did, uh, the, the main conclusion is that during pregnancy from 15 or 14 weeks to 18, 19 weeks, the aqueduct is reduced in size, is very prominent early in pregnancy, and slowly it starts to become more and more thinner, and even later on it's difficult, during the third trimester it's very difficult to see the fluid inside the aqueduct, until 20 weeks the fluid should be there, and the, the second thing that we were able to see is that the growth the growth of the the growth of the vermis with the closure uh, step by step of the communication between uh, the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna. Uh, and the last question was: Is it will be possible to differentiate between normal and abnormal cases? Uh, now, uh, when when we speak about early early ultrasound and early diagnosis of non-chromosome abnormalities, the Perhaps the, large, the largest work in the, in the literature comes from uh, the Feto Maternal uh, Foundation from Professor Nicolaides in London, where they examine 1,000 
uh, and 1,000 uh, consecutive pregnancies between 11 and 13 weeks. There were more or less 400 exa different examiners, and they make a lot of diagnosis. But the question is, did they identify any uh, midbrain anomalies? And this is the table. And no, they were not able to, to identify any midbrain anomalies as such. They have 15 cases of hypoplastic cerebellum or vermis. Only two of them were diagnosed during the first semester. And they have four cases of Blake's pouch cyst, and uh, none of them was diagnosed during the first semester. So the, the, this is a good representation of, of what happened in, in the world, very good, very good, uh, very good group that uh, we as obstetricians are not very aware of the existence at all of the midbrain. Uh, there are few papers in the literature describing early diagnosis of, of uh, midbrain pathology. This is a case from Professor Ruben Ajiron from the Shiva Medical Center in Israel. At 11 weeks, in a family known to have a, a mutation in the Fukutin gene, uh, and they were able to diagnose in the next pregnancy the presence of a cobblestone malformation, where not only the, not only the brain, also the also the the, the, the midbrain was very abnormal with a very large cisterna magna, but also the the, the face and, and the eyes were abnormal. Usually, these cases are very florid and tooth are very very easy uh, or easy to diagnose if you are aware what to look for. This is another case that comes from France, again, a case of a, a POMT1 mutation, non-isolated. Uh, the fetus presented very early in pregnancy with severe ventriculomegaly, and uh, for, uh, uh, starting for, four, for 14 weeks, they were able to see the abnormal midbrain uh, with the, the kinking of the, of the midbrain. At 17 weeks, this, the, res the findings are more or less similar. Uh, and here you see, again, the, the kinking with, and with a very good pathological specimen and a very good pathology showing here the invasion uh, of the uh, meninges by, by neurons uh, due to the uh, cobblestone uh, complex uh, disease. The, in, the, in the second study uh, we did, we put together uh, 3D store volumes of 23 fetuses between 14 and 18 weeks of gestation, we suspected anomalies involving midbrain hindbrain structures, and eventually, as, as expected, most of them were cases of aqueductal stenosis. Uh, we have six cases of cystic enlargement of the fourth ventricle, three cases of brainstem kinking, one that was a clear uh, Joubert syndrome, we have a case of rhomboencephalosynapsis, and a very rare and particular case of Moebius syndrome with calcification of the midbrain. And here I am showing you the images of the uh, of the aqueductal stenosis in different patients. Uh, you, you see that, that there are many times there are uh, other findings. Here you have a, a, a cleft clef palate, very, very marked cleft palate. Here you have the corpus callosum, elevation of the corpus callosum, a third ventricle that is quite, quite big. But in, again, in all the images, what you see is that there is not fluid in the, uh, in the aqueduct associated with the ventriculomegaly. A cystic enlargement of the fourth ventricle is very dangerous to make a diagnosis of Dandy Walker malformation early in pregnancy. Uh, in my personal experience, from around 200 cases that were referred because suspected Dandy Walker malformation, only two were true uh, Dandy Walker malformations. And this is because of the presence of the cystic big black pouches, something that can be very big. But here it's quite clear that there is not only a very, very, very small uh, vermis, there is elevation of the tentorium, big for big cisterna magna communicating with the four ventricle. And if you look here, there is also an associated uh, um, aqueductal stenosis. Uh, here you see the, lar the large fourth four ventricle. And in this case, because of, because of the aqueductal stenosis, you see the elevation of the posterior portion of the third ventricle is going up. Cystic enlargement, as I told you, is difficult to differentiate between, uh, the, between black pouch and, and, and then the Walker malformation. And here you, you see the cases of black, very clear black pouch at 15 weeks. The moment that you see in the coronal plane that the vermis is present, it's like this is echogenic in comparison with the hemispheres. Even when there is a large four ventricle and a, a apparent communication 
between the, the four vent the four ventricles and the sternal magna. Eventually, in these cases, the vermis will come to be co to be normal. If not at 22 weeks, can, it will be normal at 24 or 28. But if there are no associate, associated malformations, do nothing. The patient will do okay. And this is another case of a Blake pouch, very prominent. I think that many of our colleagues will say that this here, uh, Dandy Walker, actually turned out to be a normal cerebellum uh, at 20 weeks. And here you see, you, you see very nicely here the, 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 the fascicum that represents the normal cerebellum, the normal midbrain. And this is the co to compare with the case of Dandy, of Dandy Walker, where this uh, clear elevation of the tentorium, you don't see the, you don't see the vermis in the mid sagittal plane. This is a case of cobblestone complex at 15 weeks of pregnancy. The kinking, the kinking of the of the midbrain is clear. Okay, there is a genesis of the corpus callosum, uh, something that is uh, uh, quite characteristic of, of the of cobblestone. Is the, is the almost disappearance of the uh, subarachnoid fluid around the brain because of the invasion of the of the membranes by by neurons. And, and here you, you see that this fetus early in pregnancy has a cataract. And again, this is a good image in the pro proper uh, plane showing the, the abnormal the abnormal brainstem, abnormal vermis. And here you see the aqueduct that is still open. This is a case of Joubert syndrome, where we were able to see, starting from the, from the uh, axial plane, that the, the vermis is not is not here. The fourth ventricle is is very small, and this is the, this was the first pregnancy at 23 weeks. Okay, in the coronal in the coronal plane, you see something that is quite characteristic. First of all, you don't see the perecogenic vermis in the middle, and you see that the folia, instead of going in a horizontal direction, they go up. They go up, and and this this is quite characteristic in our experience of um, of Joubert. So. The, the patient become pregnant, pregnant again, and here at 16 weeks, again in the in the axial planes, it seems that everything is normal. But when you look you look a little bit more in, the, in depth, you see that the fourth ventricle is small. The, uh, the 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 shape of the fourth ventricle is quadrangular instead of it triangular. And this is at 16 weeks, and this is at 14 weeks. That at, at 14 weeks, still very difficult to make the diagnosis and to recognize that something is normal is abnormal. This is uh, a, a case of exceptional case of rhomboencephalosynapsis synapsis diagnosed very early. I think that most of us will be able to make the diagnosis by the daxial uh, or the coronal plane because the vermis is absolutely not there. And the shape of the cerebellum, instead of having a, uh, uh, like a half an eight, is rounded here. And again, you, you, you can see here the, the very, very prominent, very prominent aqueduct. Uh, this here here is is a little bit more confusing, but again you see you see that the the vermis is not present. And the last the last case in the series is the case of the Mebius, where we were able to see very dilated uh, posterior recess of the of the third ventricle and calcifications involving the anterior and posterior portions of the of the midbrain. And this is the pathological specimen showing the calcification in the in the midbrain. You see here also in the coronal plane. In conclusion, what are the changes occurring in in, uh, in the midbrain hindbrain structures? First of all, verticalization of the brainstem, vermian, vermian growth, and uh, aqueductal thinning. Are there limits for good quality ultrasound? Yes, we think that should be by now with uh, the current equipment, uh, the better resolution will start to be obtained after 14, between 14 and 16, 17 weeks, we have a good resolution coming if you if you come from the anterior fontanelle, for the posterior fontanelle. It will be possible to differentiate, it will be possible to differentiate between abnormal and abnormal and abnormal cases, yes, probably yes. Uh, in some cases, we don't say that in every case, but we will be able to make diagnosis very early. And uh, what is, why, why is this important? Because early diagnosis will uh, result in a better uh, genetic counseling to our patients. Thank you very much. I try to, to do that in time, uh, and I am ready for questions.
Hello, this is Giulia Garofalo. I am a gynecologist and I'm working in Brussels. In June this year, I did a short-term scientific mission of the Neuromig, where I had the opportunities to do a fellowship at the Trousseau University Hospital. I could follow the consultation of the radiopediatrician Dr. Garel, the neuropediatrician Dr. Moutard, and the Fetal Medicine Center of Professor Jonik. This was without any doubt a great professional and personal experience that helped improve my skills in the field of fetal medicine, especially for the fetal brain. And in the end, last but not least, these opportunities um, contribute to the development of the European network of fetal specialists.